Friday, people. FT Live on Stadium. Braun. No Przinsky. Not Przinsky. You almost said Przinsky. I'm right here, though. I'm sitting in his chair. Oh. Kratz and Kipnis, who's uh, winning shirt of the day. What do you got for us, dude? Running like today. home. He better that appreciate these. He won't. He'll be he so. He he'll be he so does. smug about it. He never appreciates anything I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did uh everyone on cleveland have one of those a good amount we, we okay. started making uh i think because there was a lot of people there that were there for five six years all together so i think after a certain amount of years together i think the shirt started to come out i know one person that didn't like it didn't like it or didn't have one didn't have one and wear it who trevor bauer <laughs> Let's have a good show today. <laughs> exactly. Oh, boy. We'll, we'll get to him at some point in life. Because uh, yeah. I do think he's going to be back in the bigs next yeah. year. But um, anyway, let's charge the damn mound, shall we? Uh, so let's start with the remaining managers um, or manager seats that need to be filled here. So uh, Phil Nevin interviewed with the San Diego Padres. They're taking a while to get theirs done. Um, Mike Schilt is a candidate. Ryan Flaherty is a candidate. Benji Gill was a reported candidate. We had Joe Madden on our show who said he wanted to be a candidate. I don't know if he ended up actually meeting with them, but we've had this manager carousel going on, Kratz. The Padres have their own manager carousel that's been going on for a decade now. So I can understand why they want to get this one right. I would think this will be the last... Is this fair? The last manager under the A.J. Preller era, this, this will be it. Because either they're winning and this manager will stick around for a while, or they won't. And they'll say, okay, enough. We've been trying with a lot of resources for a while, and it's just not working. I, I don't know. I asked a question to – I forget who I asked yesterday. Um, but he, I was like, you know, the whole, the whole Ron Washington – thing getting hired with the angels you're th you're sitting there going okay does he want to win like is it a job he just wants to be a manager similar can be said about the padres like why are the padres not in on the other guys is it the fit is it the fact that aj preller knows that buck showalter wouldn't fit well in this clubhouse is it completely a power play by aj preller like it i i'm i'm confused I do like the Phil Nevin interviewing, though. I just I don't know if I see Flaherty being a new young manager with this team that AJ Preller built. Schilt, I just don't. I'm not in lockstep there, but AJ might like him. But I feel like Phil Nevin would bring in some like he, you know, a little bit, a little bit more of a back and forth. Like he's not afraid to stand up for what he needs to stand up for. But he's also, you know, maybe not hated by Preller, who I don't, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm so confused by the Padres. <laughs> uh, do you know any of those guys, Kip? And also, from what I collected on the Angels side, Phil Nevin didn't really do anything wrong. He's just part of a system there that you know is a mess from the owner. Um, I even heard that players were vouching for him to stay, but it's not up to them. So. Yeah, I, I could see Phil Nevin working. Also, I think Phil Nevin's reputation is interesting because sometimes people see him as like big, tough, you know, gets into it with people sometimes like publicly. But I think behind the scenes, he's actually pretty, pretty laid back and, and easy to relate to for most people. Of those names, I think Phil Nevin offers you the best case scenario. I think he brings the most uh, – experience to that table i i like guys like flaherty but uh, again i think kratz was hinting on this i think with the the lineup and the roster that san diego has put forth it changes things it changes how and who you have to bring in and i as much as i think flaherty 
Ryan deserves one, but you have, he used to play with Machado and it's tough when you have these guys who make so much money and uh, have these personalities, a former teammate might not be able to command as he'll command a certain kind of respect, but he won't be able to really put them in the place that say a, a much older veteran guy, maybe like a Nevin can, I think. I'm not saying anyone of this sort would do this, but a Machado or something like a former team, it could be like, ah, shut up or something like that. But because he, because he, the line's a little blurry of former teammates and managers when they become uh, working together. We just had one who just got let go in David Ross. And and so that's kind of what I'm going on. And I think uh, that was my, my one year there was his first year was 2020 with Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I actually do want to say I thought Ross did a, a phenomenal job of walking, tiptoeing that line of knowing when to be the former teammate and when to be the manager. And he was there. There's a certain divide. It's probably like a 90-10 where you're the manager, and then the 10% is still friend because you gotta you gotta command the respect and you have to know that hey, what what you say goes in, in certain things, and um, and you just have to use that 10% that friendship part as a, a benefit to you, and the a benefit makes it easier to communicate together. So. But I think with the roster for San Diego, that just that's calling for someone with a little bit more experience that can kind of reel everybody in a little bit more. Doesn't that doesn't that don't Kip? That's what I was that's who I was going to ask you about. Doesn't that kind of like that relationship already happen when you're teammates? Like in the sense of like, I, I, let's let's say an example like Flaherty and Machado used to hang out, or were they just teammates? And Flaherty was a guy that could be like, hey. Yeah, you know, easy. Slow your roll. Because even superstars need to be told to slow their roll or they're just going to get out of hand and you're never going to have any semblance of of order in the clubhouse. I'm not saying Flaherty can't be like slow your roll. What I'm saying is how Machado responds to hearing that from, yeah. say, a older manager compared to someone he's played with. That's the difference that I'm trying to distinguish. And I think yeah. um, the benefits you'll get from – playing for someone that you played with I think the communication can be a lot easier but I think there's to me that just you're walking this fine line of a respect thing where it's like because that line's blurry where they look at you almost as a still a teammate or a former teammate and a friend rather than a uh superior I guess in that instance yeah no, I, hear you. I, I like that blend with Nevin right he played he's been a star actually yeah. for that ball club and he also can be laid back behind the scenes and give you like that West Coast chill, but still put someone in their place. You know, it's almost like another candidate with a team already that would come to mind would be Bob Melvin would make sense. You know, that type of manager. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? I mean, it seemed like a really good fit there, but I guess he didn't get along with, uh, with Boss. Phil's gonna be able to Phil's gonna be able to see his house if he manages in San Diego. If if I were to, if I were to push my chips in one direction, I would say I would say if the Padres have a successful year next year, it's because Phil Nevin comes in and is the manager. Okay. And with all that being said, he probably won't get it. But it was good to at least kick it around. Good we'll story. See. No, but I'm 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 glad we have consensus there, at least, you know, from the list. And also in fairness, I don't know a ton about you know Benji Gill's managing skills like I just don't have a lot of background there so I don't want to rule that out if someone's like oh you're you know you're not giving him enough credit I don't have enough there to to offer I don't know if you guys do but I don't so I, I haven't come I across know. Benji I don't know anyone that knows him so that yeah. one's a little more of a wild card for me um all right let's get to a little update we didn't get to from yesterday's show and Kip we spent like an hour plus a couple of days ago on Brian Cashman's press conference and how Steinbrenner is speaking. So we're not going to go down the entire route, but we can get a little take from you because you weren't with us the other day. And it was definitely an unconventional press conference. But the one layer in terms of visuals that we want to show everyone is, you know, he was saying that the Yankees have the smallest analytics staff in the American League East. There has been research done on this. And I think we've got it for you. There it is. It might be a little tough to see. Um, can we show that full? There we go. Small, so, so this is from Eric Boland, who was on our show the other day. Kip writes for Newsday, and he is plugged in as hell. And he said, during Tuesday's press conference, Cash said the Yanks have, quote, the smallest analytics department in the American League East. According to Four Ring Sports, as of August 27th of this year, that did not appear to be the case. You can see that chart 
The Tampa Bay Rays are number one, barely ahead of who's that in number two? Anyone? New York Yankees. Correct. New York Yankees. So your your thoughts on all of that, and also I, I don't know if you caught what I said, Kip, but my one thing was even if that was the case, they still could be like seven or eight overall, and I don't even think that matters. It's how much influence do certain people in that department have, which is part of the problem too. Well, I didn't I didn't need to see this graph to know that that statement was full of shit. So, because. Um, <laughs> And I'm strictly going off of conversations with former teammates that have played for the Yankees or have gone through that place. At some, and one of the main things they rave about is the analytical side of their that organization is just how much information hitters have to their uh, advantage. And um, so there's just no chance that they were near the bottom. I think maybe he looks at it as it's the smallest because he's just – delegated it to a few people and then kind of push it off his table and worried about some other stuff. So it's not, it's maybe it's the smallest to him personally, but across the league, that makes absolutely no sense with all the advantages that the Yankees have had and um, the, the numbers and uh, statistics that are presented to them. Just never, that never seems like the case from a, a player standpoint. So that's not a statement. It seemed like, I think if you go, I think if you go to a guy like DJ LeMahieu and you say, DJ, what was it like coming from Colorado to New York? While DJ would probably be like, good. <laughs> if you're his teammate and he can sit in a hot tub in his relaxed time and talk about what it was really like, he had so many advantages from the analytic department. Yeah. The team uses a ton of analytic decisions. And I would kick back against what Scott said, not necessarily the influence – because the Rays have a lot of influence on their analytics and it works out. I would say the continuity. Where's the continuity to minor league development with analytics making those players become big league players that are successful? What is that? Like if you have a ton of success in the minor leagues and you can't do it in the big leagues, you are done as a player. I've lived that life. Like you have success in the minor leagues – you go, and, you go and play in Japan if you hit a bunch of dingers in the minor leagues if you don't translate that success to the big leagues. So to me, it's the continuity. So if you have a lot of people in a department, whether or not the size of the department or not compared to other organizations, you know, he could have said, oh, well, maybe money-wise or maybe, you know, he wasn't talking about people-wise. Whatever it is, it's the continuity. How do you make those transitions? And being with the Rays – I know they make those transitions. They have people that that tell the big league player or the big league coaches who then implement it. Like let's say let's say uh, money. I'm forgetting money. My money was his name. He was a little tiny uh, analytic guy for the Rays. He would give information to Chad Matola, who was a fringe. He was like a four A player. Played a long time in the minor leagues, some in the big leagues, and has been a hitting coach with the Rays for a long time. He would give him information. And Motor would, Motor would, would uh, you know deliver it to the hitters, or Timmons would deliver it to the hitters, the assistant hitting coach, the first base coach, now the big league hitting coach for the Brewers. So it's about that continuity in between each each person uh, or each department and making it one fluid motion through through the big leagues to W's in the big leagues. I think, and uh, this might be just adding on to what Kras just said, I think the continuity should be not only through the organization departments out to the big league team, there needs to be continuity between your low le lower levels to the big league team. It's, if you're having success in the minor leagues and you have a way of going about things and you come up to the big league level and you have all these new analytical terms and um, numbers thrown at you that you've never used before or seen before or – you're like, hey, let's practice. We This guy's fastball rises four inches, so we're going to practice swinging a ball and a half above this baseball. And you've never done that before. You're you're not going to have success, or at least not the same success you've had in the minor leagues. So I think when you hear about a Tampa, and I've heard it even in a Houston or something, they integrate what they do at the big league level all the way down through the minor leagues. So it's not just a surprise once they get up there. So add that to the continuity that can help uh, the players succeed with the information. Also, resources are good. I mean, looking at that graph, 
The top five is Tampa Bay, Yanks, Dodgers, Phillies, Mets. I mean, aside from the Mets, those are teams that have had pretty good success over the past decade. I guess you could kind of make a case. I mean, the Mets had a, a few good years. They're certainly not bad, right? It's not the bottom rung. Now, it's easier to go to the other end. Who bottom the five bottom? teams. Who are the bottom five? <laughs> Oakland. Poor Oakland. Colorado. Miami. White Sox. Kansas City. Now, I promise you also, there will be massive restructuring with one of those teams going on over the next year or two, and that would be Miami. Miami just hired Peter Bendix, who was running shit at Tampa Bay, and they bring him in for one reason and one reason only. We want to be the race. It's a very simple conversation. They sit down. It's surprising to me kind of of that bottom five, but it... uh... You would think most teams would look at this graph or this list and see which teams are at the top and which teams are at the bottom and kind of put together, hey, maybe we need to concentrate on this a little bit more or use this a little bit more. And that goes against a lot of what I've said in the past of like how the game can't be all analytical, but to use it wisely can be a, a, a smart thing, obviously. I'll say this, and it's ironic that I'm actually wearing this shirt today because I did a little bit of work for True Media they're in 22 of the 30 big league teams. And of those bottom three, I mean, those bottom five, three of the organizations did not have a connection to this analytical company. And now after I talked to them, two do not have a connection. And one of them, like you said, Miami is moving in the direction. And I think it's it's because they're able to, or they're willing to ask questions based on their big league staff. Hey, what are we missing here? What can, what can give us value without pushing all in to our salary on the field? That's a good combo. Um, we will uh, also just have to see what they actually do with their roster in the off season. That, that kind of helps tell a lot of the story too. No, I mean, yeah, but you're talking about Miami? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm tying a bow on this with the Yankees. Oh, with the yeah. Yankees? Yeah. The Yankees are still going to be in. Are we going to be talking about the Yankees the same way in a month if they sign Yamamoto, trade for Juan Soto, and, you know, add another outfield back? Are we going to talk no, the same No, we're going to say, hell yeah, that's how you get it done because the talent on the field makes the difference. Yep. Hello. It's all about W's. This show knows what's up. Uh, you know, this is, this is a – bunch of players on, on a show talking about the game, you know? It's not like, oh, how can we save the most money and have the most successful team? Like, uh, they, the the voting just now for Mike Elias to win exec of the year was like, they were all giggling, like, oh, my God, they tanked for six years and they don't spend any money and they're so good. Like, there's so many dudes that are so proud of that and that's that's not what we do on this show. That's, no. that's not cool to brag about that. Not cool. Um, not that he, he's done an exceptional job. I'm just saying, like, that model sucks for fans. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, poll question for you. Based off the stomach issues that are being experienced and at the now canceled GM meetings, um, what caused the virus? Wrong answers only. Scott Boris puns, Brian Cashman's tirade, room service, or a write-in candidate, which you can drop either in the YouTube chat or somewhere on social, and we'll show a few during slap hands watch stadium.com slash file territory to vote or the QR code on your screen. Dave O'Brien is talking Braves with us next. They lost Ron Washington. They've got a who's about to win some big awards and they're bumping up their payroll. Let's go. There's certainly a pressure on guys like Otani to set the market, so to speak, when it comes to the financial part of the deal. Um, I do think other teams are going to offer him more money. I mean, when, if Steve Cohen wants this guy, the Mets are going to throw the bank at him. Uh, and the Giants have had, you know, they've, they've, they've tried to get uh, Aaron Judge, Carlos Correa these last few years. Uh, I think they're sitting on a pile of cash as well. And uh, the only one little wild card team, and, and I've started to hear rumblings about this, is a team like the Texas Rangers. You know, look at what they did last year, and you look at the talent they have on that team, and, and that's returning to that team. I don't know if they can afford another contract like uh, Otani's with all the big money guys they have there, but you could make an argument that if you want to win, the Rangers are a pretty good team to go to right now. 
Okay, so let's flip it because we're doing cases for basically half the league because we can rule out about half the league. But the other half we are running through over the next couple weeks. The case for Shohei Otani returning to the Angels. Give us a percentage chance. Give us any insight and reasoning for why, I guess aside from comfort and knowing what you're working with, he would return to the same ball club. I don't want to say a 0% chance, but I don't think it's going to be much higher than 5 maybe 10% at the most. Listen, he's been here six years. He's seen the turmoil this team has uh, uh, been dealing with over the last few years. I think he's played for four different managers. He's on a second general manager. And now, back to foul territory. The Athletics, David O'Brien, back on the show with us, joining FT What's Live. What's going on, with, fellas? No, no AJ today for you, David, but you do have... No, a, thank God. And Kipnis. <laughs> yeah, so it's Friday. We're trying to hang out, you know, just keep it low-key. And we do have a lot to get to with you. So I actually want to start here to get Kratz fired up because you're actually one of the most relevant people to ask this question to. So first off, congrats to the Braves. They win the first team Silver Slugger, Acuna Olsen, and Riley rack up. I did all I could, thanks. Yeah, you... Your writing just really sold <laughs> sold the show. But your writing also helped players who read you across MLB see that Ronald Acuna Jr. should be player of the year voted on by his peers over Shohei Otani. And the guy right above you in that box right above you strongly disagrees that I Acuna that. should have won. Your thoughts? I didn't say that. You're making that up. I didn't say that. <laughs> Wait. I said he think? should be. I should. I said he should be National League MVP. But do you? Think, who do you think's Player of the Year? Uh, I think Acuna, but I can honestly see where Otani. I mean, it, it just depends on how you look at it. If you're going to look at it on overall impact, um, you know, obviously Otani is just it's hard. It's apples and oranges because he pitches. I mean, it's so hard to say that another guy's more valuable if he just hits and plays defense. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I would also argue that it's hard to say you're the most outstanding or most valuable player when you didn't play the last six weeks and your team didn't even get to the playoffs. I know the Braves got beat, but the the Angels didn't even get in the playoffs. So I don't know how you could argue that he is the most valuable player, but if it's most outstanding player, I don't know. I don't I don't have an answer to that, but I do. I'm glad he's not in the AL because that would make my argument more difficult. But I don't think there's any way Acuna's not the MVP. He shouldn't be. He should be unanimous MVP in the National League. Completely agree with the unanimous MVP, Player of the Year, most outstanding player. He just won a Silver Slugger, and Acuna is the only person that has a lower ERA than Shohei. Like, of course it's Shohei. Shohei's doing all this and he's pitching. He didn't miss six yeah. weeks. He missed. Well, he missed like yeah. three and a half weeks. You're you're, well, you're you, pushing you, your rhetoric. <laughs> I thought it was six weeks. Okay. Um, I think that uh, I think if you really look at it the way you are, and I understand why you're looking at it that way, you could say Otani, as long as he does the hitting pitching thing, which he's not going to do next year because the obviously Tommy John. But if he's doing the hitting and pitching thing like he did the last couple of years. You could argue that he should be the most outstanding player for as long as he does that because nobody else is doing it. I mean, yes. it's just – it's apples and oranges. So I say – I would not disagree with that. I would not make a hard case that anybody else should – as long as he's doing both at a high level, then he's the best player. I mean, he's like the Babe Ruth of modern day. Only Babe Ruth didn't do both simultaneously for any extended period like Otani has. But if Otani has a that. four ERA and the same exact hitting numbers as he had this year, which were more home runs, and he's had 20 stolen bases. I get it. Acuna had 70, so he had 50 more stolen bases. That's elite. But if he had a four ERA, is he still not the most outstanding player? What he is doing, like yeah. we should name, we should name the the award after him when he is done playing. Uh, yeah, if he has a four ERA and does what he's done offensively, I agree. He's the most outstanding player. If he's making 30 starts, I mean, how can you argue that he's not? I mean, you know, and I think there's probably some, I don't want to say uh, 
bias towards American born players and all that kind of thing, or guys who are more, uh, who are more, who work better with the media and make themselves more available. But I think there probably is. If we had a guy, if we had uh, Freddie Freeman doing exactly what Otani is doing, <laughs> there wouldn't even be any debate about who is the most outstanding player. Let's face yep. it. There wouldn't be. All right. So while we're on that topic, Dave, we are running a little series on the case for Shohei Otani. He ain't coming to the Braves. Wow. <laughs> we didn't even get through the freaking graphic. We didn't even get through the animation. Come on. <laughs> I like to usually start it off with what's the percentage chance? Yeah, have you heard zero. Any discussions? Zero. No. Total zero. Do, do you have like confirmation from a <laughs> no, team official? I don't. Have they come out? They can't publicly no, say because you're not allowed to say that. But, and they would. But why be, are you so emphatic? I didn't even finish. I didn't even finish three words, and you're like, "Yeah, I've seen the series. Forget it. Take us off." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Realistically, what's Otani going to get? Even with the TJ surgery, he's going to get less money than he would have if he was healthy. Because if he was healthy, he's going to get the first fifty million dollars a year AAV. Right, if he's healthy, right, and probably yeah. still close to that. Like, let's just assume in my it's mind, be well I feel over like five hundred is safe. Right, it's going to be it's well over 40, forty a year. Sure. Okay, the Braves, with all of the extensions they just they gave out in the last three years, there's like six or they got eight guys signed long term. Six of them are really long term extensions. Not one season of any of those contracts, including Ronald Acuna's, including Olson's, including uh, Austin Riley's. Striders, none of them. Is there a salary higher than $22 million? So you're going to say Otani's going to come in and you're going to give him over $40 million. You're going to give him basically twice what you're giving anybody else per year. You're going to say, Ronald Acuna, your contract peaks at $17 million a year, which is ridiculously undervalued, obviously. But we're going to give another guy three times what we're giving you. And we expect you to be happy with that. I just don't see it. I don't see how it would work. And uh, he's not going to have the kind of uh, off the field endorsement opportunities in Atlanta that he might have some other places. There is a significant Asian population here, believe it or not. I know I know a lot of people probably don't think there is, but there is. But nothing like he's going to have in a Pacific Rim city like San Francisco, L.A., uh, uh, Anaheim, whatever. Uh, Seattle. Or, or Seattle, obviously. I think if Seattle was still had their previous owner, who was what a Sony guy, I think it'd be a no brainer. I think it would be no question. That's where he would end up. I still feel like you'll end up in one of those cities rather than uh, Texas, Chicago, or New York. I cannot see Otani with his whole entourage thing and his whole, the way he, I don't even talk to the media except days that I uh, pitch and after the game's over. Otherwise he doesn't talk unless he feels like doing it one day, his three home runs. Okay. I'll talk to you. I'll deign you with an audience. But that's just the way he operates. And I understand because he's got 50 people there every day. They want to talk every day. But can you imagine him having that that attitude or that approach in New York? It won't work. And I just don't see him wanting to deal with all that thing in New York. Just to can't see it. I see him on the West Coast. Just like I saw Craig Council, I thought there was no way he was ever going to go to the Mets. And I said that on our podcast. Knowing Council as I do back since he was a rookie with the Marlins when they traded for him from the Rockies and knowing what a Midwestern guy he was and his deep, deep ties to Milwaukee. I thought the only ones that made sense were Cleveland, Milwaukee, or a Chicago right there in that area. To me, that made the most sense or, or he'd sit out a year. Yeah. But with all the money that they've all saved from all these great deals from signing these guys early, you finally can cash out and aim high and get Otani with that. Um, but I hate to actually, I'm going to have to even almost side with Derek on this one. It's like Atlanta, it might be the one organization. Otani doesn't make sense. Otani, you don't, they don't need him in this sense. And I, I, I can make a case for Otani on every other organization, how he makes every club better. It's they, that's not where they're, they're so good and so deep in everything. It's the one team that can probably be like, we're good it kind of flies in the face of their whole business model. I mean, it's yeah. just like, we're going to throw that out the window. What we've been preaching for three years, signing these young guys to these below market deals, trading security for li them leaving money at the, on the, on the back end of these contracts. And they all acknowledge that, but they're getting security and playing at a place they want to be and all that. Well, it's like the Braves are going to say, okay, but never mind all that. We're going to go get Otani and give him three times what we're giving some of these other studs you know, and double what we're given Austin Riley or Matt Olson or any of them double the, at least double what we're giving any of those guys. They got, they would pay him 
what they pay any of those two guys combined and then an additional 10 million probably. Well, keep in mind the market always keeps resetting. They always right. get those guys early on for 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 low deals or for for team friendly deals, if you will, because they sign them earlier and they never get probably their full value on their first contracts. Right. So they're already they're already lower than what they expect. And then Otani would be signing later later. So it's like you're like, okay, well, you're gonna give them double of what these guys doubles might be a fair value if you think about it at the end of the day. I just don't think he's the fit, maybe there. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's not fair value. I just think for this place, the way they do things, the way they've what they've done has allowed them to spread the wealth, so to speak, and have these guys locked up long term at almost every position on the diamond. Whereas if they waited and signed a guy like like Freddie in the last year before free agency, they would have had to pay him obviously well over that twenty two million. And they're going to have to break that model soon that or that number soon because the, the market has reset. And like you said, and their payroll is rising and they will spend a little more. So somebody's going to get twenty five million a year. Uh, if they sign Max Freed, I can't see him signing for $22 million a year AAV. You know, they might have to go three years, $75 million with him. Uh, I mean, that's probably real low for Max Freed. But coming off the injury, maybe he takes that for security. I doubt it. Maybe four years, $100 million, that kind of thing. But I doubt it. They've waited too long, I think, with him like they did with uh, – pretty much like they did with uh, Freddie and Dansby. So you already – so you just made the case for why they're going to sign Otani because you said – they're gonna play. They're gonna pay two players the same as they're gonna play one player, <laughs> and he's two and he's players. two players. Yeah. Well, he hadn't proven yet that he could be two players for an entire season, year after year. Well, I mean, there's a reason nobody else has done that because it's too damn hard on the body, as you know. I don't think he could. I do not think he can keep doing it for four or five more years. I don't know if he can keep doing it for two or three more years. I mean, I talk to starting pitchers and they tell me I don't understand how he does it because they need those three or four days between starts to get it back. It's not like it was in the old days where guys threw 120 pitches. Now they're throwing 70, 80, 90 pitches, max effort, and the next day some of them can barely lift their shoulders. And he's out there playing. You know, he's not even icing down after the you know after he comes out of a game because he's still playing. So. It's tough, man. I don't see how he's going to keep doing that. But I think Otani, either as a pitcher or a hitter, when he stops doing that in two or three years, will still be worth the value of his contract, probably, with uh, you know what he's going to do in the first two or three years and the butts he's going to put in the seats and all that. Just it's going to have to be with a huge market or a huge uh, payroll team, I should say, not a huge market because they're all, you know, all the top ten are huge markets, but not them are all huge payrolls. All right. So they're out on Otani, and Otani's going to sign with the Mets and beat the Braves year in and year out. But <laughs> what are the Braves going to do? What, are, what it wouldn't do be the first guy that do? the Mets. It wouldn't be the first guy the Mets signed, and we all said, "Ooh, the Mets are going to beat the Braves now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they got they got a long way. They got more than Shohei to 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 get back to get to where the Braves are. But what do the Braves need to do? Do the Braves look at their season and say, "Hey, we are so good in the regular season, but..." No. Nah. Whatever we got to do, we just got to sign all the Phillies players away in the postseason, and then we'll be good. Well, to their credit, um, Alex Anthopoulos said the, uh, yesterday that I would like to assign it to randomness and say that, you know, what happened in the postseason for two years in a row is just random, and you're not, there's really nothing you can do about it. But he said, I wouldn't be doing my job if I did that, and we have to look at everything. And and honestly, the, the thing that's bit them in the ass the last two years in a postseason, both years, both years the lack of starting pitching depth when they're healthy, they have a really deep, good starting rotation, but they just didn't have anybody that could step in with for a freed and a Charlie Morton last year. Both of those guys were, were, uh, were hurt and are this year, Charlie Morton last year, freed and Strider coming in. Freed was coming off a sickness. He lost 15 pounds, which he's a, he's not a guy that can afford to lose 15 pounds. He was weakened by the flu. He wasn't himself at all last year. Strider was coming off an oblique. He wasn't himself. He was tired after two innings and, and got lit up in the third. This year, they're out, they, they, played, they did the NLDS without Charlie Morton because of ligament, uh, finger ligament injury. And with, uh, with once again, Freed coming in really rusty because of uh, his injury situation. He had a, you know, the blister again. So he only made one start in like three, four weeks before the NLDS. So both years, they had two of their main three starters down. Are, are not at full strength. And they ran up against a Phillies team that was 
that surged both times and had guys all hitting on hitting on all cylinders offensively and just wrecked them. So they've got to be able to go into next year's postseason knowing that, hey, if we have another one or two starters down, we still got – we're not going to have to rely on Bryce Elder, who had a six ERA down the stretch, got lit up in his last three starts and was on fumes because it was the most innings he'd ever pitched. We're not going to have to rely on him as one of our three starters in the postseason. That's why they've got to go out and get somebody, even though they they brought Charlie back on the $20 million option. They still got to go out and get a frontline guy, whether that's trade for Corbin Burns, which would to me would be ideal, even though he's only one year left on his deal. Um, trade for Corbin Burns, sign Sonny Gray, you know, to, to team with Freed, Strider, and Charlie Morton so that you're covered for that you know, first round, you're going to have three starters, even if you, if a couple of them are rusty or down or whatever, like they were the past two years, because the offense, I mean, no, they didn't hit in the NLDS this year, but I don't think the offense, I think the offense is fine. I really don't think you need to do anything with the offense. But if you sit here and go, okay, let's say, let's say they had Charlie Morton. Let's say they had Charlie Morton in his last series. You don't, you don't run Bryce Elder out there. You already lost the Strider game. And then you lost the next Strider game. You weren't winning until the last until the last inning of the free game. So are you going to bring in? Let's say let's say they get the greatest starting pitcher available to me. I think it's Corbin Burns in a trade. Are you right. going Strider? I know you were striking out ten guys per six innings in the season. We're going to go Corbin Burns, or they're going to be 0-2 in a five game series again, and Corbin Burns is going to throw game three to save your life. No, that's not the way I look at it. If Freed's healthy, Freed goes game one this year, and it's a different story. Wow. If Freed, Freed, Freed wasn't at 100%, okay? If Strider goes game two, and you've got Corbin Burns, or Corbin Burns going two and Strider three, whatever way you want to configure that, depending on what happens during the season, I think you're fine. The, uh, they didn't hit in that first game. Are you going to tell me, though, that the offense is flawed because they didn't hit in that first game? Uh, <laughs> Zach Wheeler was phenomenal against the Braves. He's a great pitcher when he's on, when he's at it on top of his game, he's a elite pitcher, top five, top 10, for sure. They didn't hit, but that doesn't mean you have to do something different with the offense. Does it? I just didn't think, you know, they didn't hit, but if they had, if they, if the game, if the series goes another game, maybe they do hit, they did wake up for a couple of innings where they hit the home runs in that one game. But I just think that the starting pitching was the biggest problem. Uh, and also the bullpen needs to be strengthened because the bullpen, it's not like they came in and shut it down. If the bullpen was a lot deeper, then you would have been able to get a couple of those guys out of there even faster and been able to rely on that bullpen to go five, six innings strong. But they didn't have those kind of relievers down the stretch this year at all. Not like 21 where they had those three relievers who were all but unhittable in the postseason with Matzik and uh, Will Smith. Uh, and mentor, all three of those guys in the postseason were phenomenal. I mean, they hit they, that happened. It didn't happen this year, and they weren't even close to having that kind of bullpen this year. I think the offense is set. The offense, you're absolutely right. I think you don't really have to touch that one. A lot of teams aren't rolling into the playoffs with the offense that the Braves have. I think you're, you're yeah, it wasn't on. fluky. You know, they yeah. did average OBP home runs. It's not like they were just a home run. Uh, that's all they did was hit home runs. They didn't look at their average and OBP. They led in everything. You're, you're absolutely right that it's coming down. I think they do need that another starter. And I think the joke I made earlier where it's like all the money they've saved on the contracts that they've signed, I think now you do go get that Corbin Burns. If you're in your window now, yeah. which you clearly are as the Atlanta Braves, that's the type of move you make to go get a starter. One move Tani, that you, you go get yeah, Otani. You can get that. <laughs> <laughs> One move that I, if he was pitching next year, I'd say go get Otani. <laughs> no kidding. No, then, then yeah, if he's still pitching, I might make my case that Atlanta could use Otani. Sure. <laughs> and take the payroll of the $275 million. Right. They're going to do now, that. I, I was there uh, in, in only the Gwinnett. I was in AAA for the 2021 season, So, but I was with the Atlanta organization. And one thing, yep. one move that was made that I think they are going to feel a little bit is the absence of Ron Washington. Oh, um, God, yeah. So I think you know exactly where I'm going with this. I think the relationships, and this is just from observing there for a spring training and a little bit more, the relationship that he has with Ozzy, the relationship that he has with the, all of his infielders, on top of he you – don't, you don't show up lazy to a field that Ron Washington is at. You do not, you do not half-ass your work. You, he doesn't allow you to. You have the the morning drills that Ron Washington puts you through as an infielder and the respect that he commands and the 
that's fine. You don't you don't have your your hundred percent today. Well, give me a hundred percent for these fifteen minutes, and I'll let you get out of there. But you're not going to do fifty percent of a, an hour of work. We're going to get something done. We're going to get it done right. I think Atlanta's going to feel that absence a little bit more than people realize of Ron Washington not being there next year. Oh, I think anybody here realizes how much they're going to feel that absence. I think yeah. it's their biggest loss of the offseason, harder to fill, arguably, than starting pitcher. I think he has that. And and you were there. You saw it's not just his infielders. It's the entire clubhouse yeah. that he yeah. affects. He's yeah. like the master motivator. He's the guy that goes around putting the affirmations printed out in guys' lockers, just everything. And it doesn't come across as corny because nothing Ron Washington does comes across as corny. I mean, just his language – it alleviates any possibility of it being corny. I mean, that guy's the only guy I know that cusses more than I do. He's he's pretty he is he is a special guy. As Alex Antopoulos said, he's been in the game a long time and he's never been around anybody like the six years he spent with Ron Washington. He is I he totally is, agree. Samuel L. Jackson in a baseball uniform. Yeah, he's phenomenal. He's oh, phenomenal. Okay. And uh and and you know, if you see guys like Freddie that go to the Dodgers, they're now doing those pregame drills exactly like Washington did because Freddie told his guys out there, I need somebody to do this with me before the games. So now it picks up and other teams starting to do this and it, because it's effective, you know, it, it gets it guys in the right frame of mind and on top of the physicalness of the drill itself, the, the, the work that he's doing on backhanded, you know, short ops and all that. It we just have- gets guys going. We kept it going down in Gwinnett, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about, where other guys who have gone through that organization, go on to different organizations, are like, hey, can we do this? Can we try this? Where I get on a knee or, and do then right. go through about 15 each way. I think they're like, where'd you get this? And it's like, it's from Washington and Atlanta, where it's just like, because you said it exactly, it works. It's something that I know that even if it's just real short for seven to eight minutes, it locks me in, it gets my hands ready for the game, and I know I'm being productive, and it's not wasting that much energy – but uh, like you said, also with the wash, where it's just like his character alone keeps people locked in. It, it, it raises the level of professionalism. Get rid of the language. That's fine. That's just, no, no baseball player really cares about hearing swear words or anything like that. The professionalism that he has and the day to day energy and just like yeah. he he's there to win no matter what. I guarantee anybody that played for him in Texas can tell you the same way. And he's surrounded by when he's doing those one-on-one drills with Ozzy, with Olsen, with Freddie before that, with Dansby before that, they're surrounded by like 12 guys usually because yeah. there's so much positive energy coming out of there, the ball busting and all that. But just the positive energy, it's like uh, it's like the kind of the pregame version of guys sitting around a hot tub in the old days drinking beers. You know, this is what's happening before the game there, and guys are getting locked in and listening and just – they want to be there. They just gravitate yeah. towards Wash doing these drills with guys. He's got outfielders coming over and like outfielders coming over and doing the drills just because they want to do it with Wash. They figure it's, it, it, it can't help. It can't do anything but help me. Okay. So then my question is all this character, all this positive. Why the heck did he take the Angels job? <laughs> well, he's 70. He's going to be 72 yeah. years old. I didn't think it, I didn't think a team was going to give him an opportunity. I thought they should have in the last five years, but I thought he was past it now because the whole uh, direction that the sport has moved with analytics and young guys and all that. But I think what's kind of saved him or gave him another chance was the success that Snitker, Bochi, Dusty, all these guys that are 70 years old or, or, and older are having. Um, I thought that maybe – and then obviously Perry Manazian was here first-hand glimpse every day of Wash doing his thing. Perry's tight with Alex, you know, his assistant, and, and so he knows exactly what Wash brought to this team. So I thought Perry is probably in a position where, okay, I got a hit on this one. I want somebody who has an impact that comes in and has a presence because Perry talked about hiring a guy with a presence. Nobody's got more of a presence than Ron Washington. Nobody. When he walks in, maybe Dusty's right there with him, but other than that, when he walks into a room, he takes over, and I think that's what uh, Perry tried it the other way. They've gone with young guys, guys that they knew were going to do everything analytically that the uh, front office wants. And 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 and, that, and Wash is even though he's an old guy, old school to the bone, he also embraces the analytics. That the Braves have got a really good analytics department. It's just that they allow the coaches to feed it to the players rather than having the you know as a uh, as uh, someone has said the pointy heads. Uh, rather than have them come directly to the players with this information and say, we need you to do this. They have the coaches 
disseminate the information. And Wash is really good at doing that, positioning and all that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not often you get everyone going, yep, that's that's a win right there. Everyone's excited for yeah, Wash. Yeah, I haven't heard anybody, anybody be critical. I mean, it's kind of like uh, – uh, I mean, we had Bobby Cox here, and you never heard anybody say a bad word about Bobby Cox. Well, Wash is even even more so, probably. You just nobody criticizes this guy. Nobody. I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, Dave, awesome catching up with you on all of that. Appreciate you. Obviously, follow him at D O B R I E N A T L. Watch his stuff in the Athletic. Follow the pod. Thanks, Dave. We'll catch you soon. Thank you. Otani sweepstakes. It's on Atlanta. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> That whole thing was like the longest, like prolonged thing ever. And there's just so much adrenaline involved. It was amazing. And you did nothing. You didn't even I, show up. I was holding some people back. It's about all I did. Were you, were you <laughs> holding your own teammates back or were you holding the other teammates back? Because you got to either be in the fight or hold someone else from the other team back. The other team? Yeah, you got to hold someone else back. There's plenty Crap, of guys. He's not you. Okay, Tanner, I'm going to give you a little context here. Kratz has gotten in a few of these, and he is um, like the Michelin man, and he just will like pick up multiple bodies and just be like, mm, mm, mm. he's superhuman strength. So, the, I mean, I, I'm only, sure you're strong, but Kratz is a beast. Well, I'm sure. I mean, I'm definitely not as big as you, Kratz. You're a catcher. Those guys are usually <laughs> all fucking huge. <laughs> Tell him, Kratz. Go ahead. Whatever. I, I need my pitchers. I need my pitchers to come out there. I mean, if you got the hood on, you're coming out like Sergio Romo came out, like, like kind of gangster. Like, what's up now? What's <laughs> up now? Like, they don't, they don't know about you. You don't have to actually throw a fight, but they're like, dang, that Terry Bybee guy, he's kind of, he's kind of scary. Like, he had the hood up the whole fight. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's just a bad look though. As a rookie trying to get in a fight though. No, not trying to get in a fight, but just like standing up for your boys. Like, yo, I got you. I got you. And then when like somebody big, like Kopech. If he if he got in your face, then you'd be like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Like I'm just trying to <laughs> I'm just trying to chill. I'm just trying to chill. Oh, hey, hey dude, hey, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> T- Tanner, listen, here's the thing. When you go out there, especially as a pitcher, you guys grab somebody, okay? On the other team, and you find someone either that you don't you like or you don't like, or even somebody you don't know, you just grab them by the shirt and you just say, Okay, we're gonna walk over here and we're just gonna hold on to each other and we're gonna peek over our shoulder what's happening, right? So we're going to be look like we're holding each other back, but we're really just witnessing and watching like this. We're like, oh, look. Oh, my gosh. He just got knocked. Oh, my God. Now, Cobra and Class A. Oh, oh, oh. oh, 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 oh. Right? That way everyone thinks you're involved. You can't just be standing there and looking around like, oh, wait, nothing's happening. you got to just grab somebody and hold them. And then it'd be like, grab me back. Grab me back. Yeah, yeah, we're fighting. We're fighting. And then no one will think no one will second guess you. And now back to foul territory. Basketball players want to be football players, and football players want to be basketball players, and we all want to play baseball. Like <laughs> baseballer viral hit of the week. It's a good discussion. C.J. Stroud, uh, big QB on the Texans. It's about all I know. I've not been paying close attention in the football world these days, and I'm an unfortunate Jets fan. But anyway, Brent Rooker also had a good reply to that, saying, <laughs> "And all baseball players want to be golfers." Back. So take it away, guys. This is all you. It's true. All I do is golf now. <laughs> I love it. It's the it's lazy also, pyramid. It's the what? It's the lazy pyramid. Go on. All football players want to be basketball players, a little bit lazy over sport. All basketball players want to be football players. Okay. So there's just, and then lazier down is the baseball players. And then even lazier than that is the golfers. I met, I met a football player one time. He had a 10-year career. He goes, you guys did nothing, and all your contracts are guaranteed. You guys stood there for four at-bats, and you stand at your position, maybe get a ball. He's like, we hit each other for 10 years straight. And I was like, eh. We had the new signings of, like, the Browns or something would come through the Cleveland uh, locker room if they were throwing the first pitch or something, and they were like, you guys got guaranteed contracts for, for how much? And they're like, what's your 40 time? This is what they're like asking everybody. <laughs> I don't know. They're like, I would blow you away. I got to do that four times a day. 
And I go, yeah, but watch this. And I like, would like, throw him a baseball like when he wasn't looking and he like drops it. I go, exactly, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> also, like put him at the, put someone at the plate and say, hey, yeah. try to hit this ball. But wait, here's the biggest part to drop on them, Kip. Drop on any football um, player especially. Yeah, we have guaranteed contracts. Where's your union at? The NFL is so fucking rich. Yeah. What, why, you guys have to it's, – it's called putting up a fight and knowing what your value is. But no have one's, seen, no one's doing seen, that because the QBs take most of the money, no? Have you seen some of the best athletes in the other sports try to swing a bat? Have you seen, like, yes. Giannis, the video of, like, Giannis and some other ones? Like, the best of the best, cream of the crop. And it's like their motor skills just disappear when a, you put a bat in their hands. Yes, absolutely. There's not – that's that is perfectly said and some of them especially like the basketball players they take a baseball and they're like <laughs> well, that, that too it's a ping pong ball i lost yeah. the ball where is the ball oh Where's it's in the there ball? you gotta dig through yeah your hands are too big dude actually great call from Derek behind the scenes he said and golfers want to be gamblers <laughs> so it's that, just a lazy pyramid that is on your lazy pyramid pyramid <laughs> but the real the real lesson here is from the footballers like Get those contracts guaranteed. They get their asses kicked. No. They need they need a better union situation. Oh, Do you agree? Fact. Always have. They get talk destroyed. About, talk about rich. We talk about how owners in baseball are rich. Come on now. Football owners. Oh, they're just like they're, you know, they're like, they're like me every first and fifteenth. You got the bandana over their mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey there, give me your money. It's a stand-up. It's true. It's true. They're on another level. I like it. All right. Um, baseballer, uh, dot com is the spot for some of their merch and also uh, for more viral hits each and every week on the show. Thanks to our friends over there. And thanks to CJ Stroud for giving some love to Major League Baseball. We'll be right back with um, a little more on Eric Kratz's trip to a casino next week. Congrats on being a finalist for AL Cy Young. Um, we keep it real here. Do you think you have a shot? Uh, I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a realist. Um, I watched I watched Cole. I mean, he pitched against us, I think, three times in the last month. Uh, and, the, you know, each one was better than the last. And his last one was a CG shutout. And so... You know, I, I understand kind of the season that he put together and really the second half that he put together. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a realist, you know, but it's still cool to, to be a part of this group. And, you know, I have a ton of respect for Sonny Gray and Garrett. And, um, you know, both those guys I've watched for a long time and been fans of the way that they go about their work. Um, they're completely different pitchers than me. And, you know, that's the cool thing. You look at um, really – NL and AL, like every guy is different, you know, nobody has like the same stuff and it's not just guys who throw hard, you know, and um, I mean, I'm the only guy who throws a split in that group. So, you know, it, it's kind of cool. It's cool to be a part of those, uh, those groups and, you know, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I have a chance of winning at all. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, <laughs> hey, you know what, if you're not first, you're last. So I didn't, that's I didn't right. say that someone else said that Ricky Bobby. <laughs> you guys, you're you're in this you're in this elite group of pitchers who dominated all season. Whether you win it or you don't, you were dominant. We bring this up all the time on the show, talking about the like elite top like five or six guys in the game any given year. Are you throwing the same pitch every single time? In the sense that like max effort, full out, or is there times when you can turn it up? You talked about watching Garrett Cole at the end of the month, like at the end of the season, the last month, you're like. Dang, like he, he turned it on more. Are there times when you can dial it up and the rest of the time you're like, ah, you know what, I can kind of cruise through here. Now I'm in a little traffic. Here's the real split. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the biggest thing with me is trying to figure out what a team is, you know, what the game plan is against the split. And now back to foul territory. And a little thanks to our friends 
at BetMGM. Latest offer is $1,500 first bet offer up to that amount. Um, for new users, if you use the code FOUL and download the app, sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into your account. You place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets, uh, depending on how much you throw down. If the bet loses, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern, call 1-800-GAMBLER. On that topic, next week, Eric Kratz will be with me at the uh, big tournament at Borgata. It's an in-person tournament. Kratz won the one of the online tournaments. Jason Kipnis, being that you finished in the money in Vegas, in the Vegas side, like I guess you could call it the West Coast portion of this tournament. What advice do you have for the man who is holding the clear, beautiful trophy for his championship victory? I think you can uh, back me up on this. Dress comfortably. Mm. <laughs> uh, I did, and Scotty was a little bit better than I was. I wore, I think I was in blue jeans and... Some I don't, not a button down necessarily, but just maybe I don't know something. When you're sitting for that long, and I, I knock on wood, you make it as long as you your little heart desires, Eric. Um, you are not comfortable sitting in that chair. So bring Advil and dress, wear sweatpants because uh, it can it you want it to be, but it can get to be a long day for you. Yes, sweatpants, Kratz, and you have to have a lot of patience. A lot of patience. That we'll build that stack early. That's when the most uh, mm-hmm. bad players are still in. Is yep. early on. Uh, some people. Nobody wants to be out or eliminated right like in the first twenty minutes. So uh, you could be a little bit aggressive early on. Mm-hmm. What about Agreed. supplements? Yeah, yeah, I they don't it. test you. Yeah, so you're good. Bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, winner of our poll was was Boris for wrong answers only on on what caused the virus. Boris puns. Um, one write in candidate that we liked was uh, Justin saying not having Seiya Suzuki in the outfield because if he was there, he wouldn't have caught the virus because of his famous butterfingers towards the end of the season. You don't like that, Kratz? That hey, is that big... is that is dynamite dropping. It's cold cold blooded right there. We'll see you on the FT YouTube channel for hour two. That includes Jan Gomes. Gun it like Gomes. Jan Gomes will join us soon. Former Kip teammate, you didn't play, you didn't come across him. I mean, I'm sure you played against him, Kratz, but you didn't play on his team, did you? Uh, no, spring training. Spring training. Okay, cool. I mean, obviously there was going to be some connection. You you want to play degrees of separation with anybody in the past like 20 years with Kratz? You're going to get what to maybe two, three tops. Two two so far. It's starting to it's starting to get new new people that are trickling in yeah to the game that would give me more of like a three these youngins yeah these youngins exactly these 21 year olds but other than that i'm young yeah well you are young you look young so young we'll talk to you on don't soon. look young You're young at heart yeah oh, young young pretty good. we have ken rosenthal joining us a little bit later on too but let's start with the big man and we'll let kip do the introductions with the shirt and the voice go ahead is he here i'm told he is here oh yes. man <laughs> 
<laughs> Hi, go, buddy. Baby. How we doing, brother? Missed you. <laughs> this is the only time we get to hang out, so I'm excited. So me and Jan, <laughs> just to pave the way, me and Jan have uh, been in the same city for two years now, and uh, we haven't <laughs> seen each other once. Um, that only is because on someone you. else came in town. What? Uh, Kluber came in town, and we had a, a, a somewhat breakfast brunch date. Oh, that's right. We did see each other once. Yeah, barely. Okay, barely. Good, good. I feel better about our relationship now. <laughs> um, I Kratz is right. He pointed at me for the blame, and I will take blame. Um, so I am sorry, Jan. Host him at the restaurant. What? He doesn't oh, mean it. He doesn't mean it. It's okay. I don't mean it, but he. No, the good news. The good okay. news is somebody's option was picked up, and we get another year to try. <laughs> it's not gonna happen, but it's okay. It's okay. We'll be in the, We'll be in the same city. Um, but yeah, to to your point, I'm excited. Uh, glad to be a Cubby again. Congratulations! Congratulations! Well mm -hmm. deserved. Um, from everything I'm hearing and seeing, is they they got the same player I got. Um, they got the leader. They got the the guy who shows up every day. So uh, well deserved on the option being picked up. Hey, question too, Jan. How how does that work? Like, take take us through. Is it just a a phone call from the club? Is it from the agency? Like, hey, we got you. And and do they give you any indication beforehand? Sorry, I, I my connection was kind of lost. I'm back. Sorry. Uh oh, I think. No, we, we got you. We hear you. I think we got to refresh. You got to see that beautiful Brazilian face. Yeah, exactly. This is it's it frozen. Right it's actually, you know, most people. Picture you're frozen on. When, it's a good... when we're refreshing, Jan, I will say this. So most people, when, if they have a connection issue for a sec and it gets frozen, Kratz, you can probably speak to this because you're on every day. Exactly. <laughs> of course, Jan's like. Just yeah, Jan just has a perfect, he just has a <laughs> perfect resting face. <laughs> Zoolander will be back with us oh, well. in one moment. There, there, he is. there you right. go. So, all right, you're, Jan, you're back. Yeah, play by play of how an option works. Like, do you get an indication before? Do you talk to the team like, hey, what are you thinking? And when did you find out the news and how? So to, um, to ask your question, uh, I have that kind of patience. I'm like, hey, guys, like, what's going on? Like, halfway through the year, I'm like, hey, can you just pick it up? Like, let me just be more relaxed towards the end of the year. But obviously, that's not how things go. Um but um, towards the end, uh, there were little conversations um, about the future of the team, and they kept including me in the conversation. So um, I, I kind of had a – that was about as much of a hit as I had. Um, but, no, I, I didn't get the call that um, the option was picked up until, you know, I think like one of the last days. And um, obviously plenty of other things have happened since then, so my, uh, my story got pushed to the side a little bit. All right, so let's talk about that other story since you're crushing your coffee right now. I kind of <laughs> teased this a little bit yesterday on the show. We were trying to have you on Monday. Let's get this timestamp right. Monday at 1.15. You're right. Yes. And I want to make sure my producer, he knows, this is out to Mark, what time did you find out about the Craig Council coming to Chicago deal? 12.35. Oh, so we could have had breaking news <laughs> on foul territory with Jan Gomes' beautiful face. So we would have not only sold the sexy part, but we would have sold breaking news. And I know you would have told us because you would never hold secrets back. I never hold any secrets from Kipnis. So, and obviously I'm <laughs> terrified of you, so I would have done it the same. <laughs> Now, now I can say it, you know, it's, uh, I kept asking Kratzy, Hey man, does somebody better come on or something? And then we talked a little bit about the, the breaking news. So I was like, you're lost brother. Uh, <laughs> All right. So is. give us, give us the details though. Kratz, like, I still want to hear what that was like, what the reaction is, the whole deal. I mean, it's, it's taken over the news cycle and managers don't usually get attention like this. So. I kind of, it's been kind of cool to cover it. It's usually about player transactions, but here we are talking about the biggest pickup so far of the off season. Man, uh, it, <laughs> Go ahead. No, it was a, it was a major shock uh, for sure. Um, no one saw it coming at all, but um, like you said, it was a, a major uh, transaction, however you want to call it. Uh, 
no, we're excited. Uh, definitely didn't like playing against the Brewers for that reason, and it starts from the top. And uh, that was one of the things uh, we've already been talking about it. Um, he uh, he changed the culture of the Brewers, and we're excited to have him on our side. You think you guys make the playoffs last year if he's your manager? Oh, I don't. I um, I, I don't think it would have made any difference. To be honest, I think uh, Rossi um, was doing it as much as he could. Uh, he did a tremendous job. And really, um, when you dig yourself a, a, a 10 games back hole, um, and we did a tremendous job digging ourselves out of it, um, there's a, in a way, newer guys, like younger guys in the bullpen. And we, the best way I could put it, we ran out of gas. That's kind of what it was. Um, we had about half of our bullpen injured. We had some guys trying to make it back. Uh, just didn't work out. Um, it was uh, definitely a, a, a you know, anytime you don't make the playoffs, it's a disappointing time. But uh, especially since that group that we had, we had such a fun group to be around. And um, that was the biggest thing that we talked about was, you know, doing the champagne shower with this group would have been a lot of fun. Jan, did you talk to David Ross since that stuff went down? You know, we're obviously giving praise to Craig and, and he deserves mm -hmm. it. He's been one of the best. But you had David there, fellow catcher. Did you guys have a conversation since? Uh, it was really um, a small one, really just, uh, you know, for me, it was it was a really great honor. It was a, um, I love the way he managed us. I love the way our our, uh, our communication level was. Uh, and as shocked as we were, I'm sure if he wants to, uh, and this is what I told him, I'm sure if he wants to, he's going to bounce back on his feet and be uh, managing or being a big part of some other team. What about the Brewers? I keep pushing this narrative. What if he pops up as the Brewer skipper? Don't you think it'd be fun for the game? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, at, at the point of uh, everything that we are now, it wouldn't be the weirdest thing that's happening. No, you're right. That's true. <laughs> All right. So, so one more here. Um, you played with Wilson Contreras. And did you feel like there was any tension between <laughs> him and Ross? Because he publicly went out and said about time and, and yeah. clearly was, was pissed off. Um. I don't know, man. Maybe slippery fingers. I don't know why that, that needs to be done. <laughs> um, I, I don't think anybody gains any tra any good traction. That tra It just becomes a story. I don't know why that happened. Uh, I felt like when, you know, I was catching with Willie last year or, you know, two years ago, um, there was a great relationship. I mean, Rossi is an intense guy. Willie's an intense guy. And that's just kind of the way it goes. And for that to, to be something that we talk about now, it's kind of unfortunate, but you know, I respect the heck out of both of them. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, just like his, uh, those comments that he made, it gets deleted. <laughs> um, by the way, on Contreras, were you surprised that the Cardinals weren't good this year in general because they've been so good every year? Like, we've asked some some others in the division. Like, hey, what did you see from St. Louis this year? Not to do with Contreras, obviously. You know, they mm -hmm. had some pitching problems. But were you surprised? Heading into the season, how did you think they were going to be? Um, I mean, definitely, you know, anytime you think of uh, the Cardinals, you think the, the – I mean, every time we played them, they were competitive, so they didn't, you know, step off the gas against us. But, um, you know, anytime I would try to keep up with them, it was closer to when we were playing them, and it seemed like they were playing better. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was a surprise overall to, to see them uh, um, not play as well. I'm laughing right now. I'm looking at the notes that we have on you coming on the show, and I'm seeing a fun fact about you is back at Tennessee where he played at every infield position except shortstop. <laughs> uh, and I, I get Why it. You're not, you're not that good of an athlete, so you don't you didn't have shortstop in you. But I, mean, I will say this for people to know, Jan would be out with the catchers or first basemen before uh, middle infielders or other infielders would come out. And anytime I saw Jan turning double plays at second base, I had to sprint out there and almost like swat the glove out of his hand. I said, get out of here. You're doing it better than everyone else. You're making everybody yeah. look bad. So Jan's hands are some of the best hands, and I hate giving him credit, and I even hate it more doing it to his face. Uh, but that goes to show that a guy can there play in this position. Um, I'm getting, you can sell, Jan. I'm getting softer in my old age, and I'm being nice to you now. <laughs> Um, yes, those are very true comments. Uh, I would, it got to the point that I would just go out there, 
as Kipnis was walking out there just to be like, dude, this is not that hard. Can you throw, <laughs> can you turn a double play for us, please? <laughs> I tried. I couldn't. Well, you got to drive in more than you let in. Then you did that. There you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> longer. How much What's longer that? you got, kid? Wow. I, I mean, hey, you, no warning on these. Uh, I love it. Uh, how much more? I don't know, man. My option got picked up. Um, I definitely promised my wife one more year, but, uh, you know, I love this game way too much to just kind of hang it up out of the blue. So, uh, things go well. I stay healthy. Um, who knows? I'll, I'll, I'll keep going until they take it off me. What do you Five mean? Five more you years, Kratz, at least. <laughs> Jan is, a, Jan is a guy, Jan is a guy that is in epic shape, like another level of shape. Like, and I'm not talking round as a shape. He, he takes... <laughs> He takes so much care of his body. Can Me you too. beat my 40 years? <laughs> Can I? Oh, uh, I'll be going into 37. So that's three more years, man. Uh, I don't know. My kids are getting older. Um, they're getting into sports. That's one of the things that kind of like um, makes me want to stay at home. But uh, I know I don't want to make any breaking news and say, yeah, I'll try to beat it. Cause then if I come up short, then, you know, I'll, you'll have that over me. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> That's fair. I mean, you talk about shape, man. So, uh, Kratzy and I were in spring training together and talk about a guy that, and honestly, and I'm being very honest with this, uh, Runners. gave me some, like, it really inspired me because yes, like you are a few years older than me. But you would be in the weight room at six o'clock in the morning or maybe even earlier than that and just crushing squats. And I mean, we walk in there and I haven't I could barely touch my toes yet. And, you know, we're, we're limping in and then Kratzy's just sitting there just warming up at 225 and just dropping. And everyone's like, what is this guy doing? Like, what? and you know, and he was the only guy that would play catch with Francisco Mejia. Because no one could, no one loved the long <laughs> toss with Francisco Mejia. I mean, those are stuff that I remember. You were like, you know, the, you know, for lack of a better word, the the saltier old dude. But you, you did, you were, you were awesome to be around, and um, that was one of the things I wanted to make sure I said when I came on. It was not you. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you said that about the fact that I long tossed with Mejia. He would. He would. He would get so mad at me too. Francisco Mejia is probably the greatest long toss player I've ever played with in my life. Ever. And that spring training, you know, Trevor Bauer was out there doing his Trevor Bauer stuff. And Mejia mm -hmm. was just like, why? Why you go so far? He's like, why you go so far? And he's just like wrist flick. And it was like <laughs> off yeah. the batter's eye, like <laughs> ridiculous long toss. Uh, yeah. And, and Kipnis is over there throwing 60 feet and complaining about it. Yeah. <laughs> Kipnis wasn't a heavy, Kipnis wasn't a heavy ball guy. Kipnis wasn't doing the, he wasn't doing the throw the ball backwards against the wall stuff. That the, the baseball was heavy enough. Yeah, the base. <laughs> he so drove more balls. Running. He drove more runs in. Yeah, right? You're gonna say there something nice go. about me as a teammate? Do you want me to? <laughs> Do I, okay, uh, let me come, try to come up with one. Uh, no, dude, Jason, and and I kept thinking about this. Like, what is something nice that I could say? So this is gonna be me trying to say something nice. Play with Jason was truly like having like like you were a brother like truly like you couldn't live with or without him like literally he had to be there all the time and you loved him because his personality you know, you brought so much joy to the clubhouse you know it but then there were times that we would look at each other and just go no no <laughs> go away just go to second and every time we've talked we had a, a very close knit group that um, that all came up together. Talk about a time that was uh, fun to, to celebrate with. And I know Jason was the, probably the biggest part of it. You know, every odd year, uh, Jason would step up, um, even though we made it a World Series in 16. So <laughs> I'll take that. Hey, right? this is the nicest Mignon have done to each other without being sarcastic. But uh, there was a good. I'm not I even sure if I said something nice. But there was a okay. good, there was a good probably two month <laughs> period of probably 2016, maybe. If me and Lonnie Chisinau were in the same room, Jan immediately <laughs> left, left the room. He's no, like, I walked can't in be, and be like, no. Yeah, I can't no, be in not the same these room. two. We no. would just be, yeah, we're like the, those two old Muppets that would just sit on training tables. <laughs> and, 
make fun of mm-hmm. everyone or just do whatever. But we, I, I'm with Jan. I think that was that kind of period we had in Cleveland of having those same guys for that long was one of the more fun, fun teams to be on for that many years. I got a question That's for cool. y'all. I got a question for both of you guys. We got. Now, I came in in spring training in 17. Don't remember. Yeah, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. The two teams that got me a – that gave me a contract, minor league contract offer was the Cubs and the Cleveland Indians. I come into spring training after that, and I never brought it up. I am, I am the biggest guy about calling people to the carpet, anything. Did you guys see that as a successful season – or a failed season? 2016. 16. Yeah. I'll let Jan take it first. All right. Um, one of the ways I look at it is the Diamondbacks. Do you consider that a successful season or a failure season? I mean, I feel like during the during that 16th season, um, the World Series kind of like shocked all of us. I mean, we got hot at the right time. And we started believing because we were just having to get over the the Tigers. We were just having to get over the uh, the Royals. They had just won the World Series. So to me, in 16, possibly one of the most surprising and most um, successful seasons I've been a part of. I'm, I'm going to echo that statement, I think. Uh, I saw a lot of what Jan said. I thought the Diamondbacks were very similar to what I was seeing a lot of us in 16 compared to their team. Um, I'm even going to cross sports here. I thought Giannis was asked something about when they lost in the finals or something. He had a very good response to it. I think Scotty remembers this video. Mm -hmm. Um, Only one team wins at the end. It it doesn't mean you can't have a successful season. It doesn't mean it wasn't a success. The stuff that we got out of that year, the experience, the, the everyone being better prepared for the following season, the success you have in the postseason. There's so many successful benefits and things experiences that you take away from a season like that you you can't help but label it a success was it did we win the world series no but to say it was a failure which is the opposite of success is is just not wouldn't be true yeah and, and memories created obviously sure i mean winning is the goal for everyone it's the goal for fans but you got pretty damn far and a lot of people had incredible entertainment experiences watching you guys and following the emotions. So my question actually plays off that too for Kip and Jan. So now you both live in Chicago. How often do people come up to you? And I guess Jan, we can start with you because like you're on the team, right? So you're on the org that if they didn't beat you guys, it would still be (laughs) one of the top topics in all of sports. Well, uh, 2019 helped me get over it. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> True. You know, I, I, I get to say it now. Uh, and to kind of a little bit of what we were just talking about the 16, uh, without the 16 World Series, that 19 World Series would have been a little bit more nerve wracking. I, I can promise you that. Um, but um, first day in, uh, in spring training, we're walking into uh, that meeting room. It's like a big auditorium. And they have this massive 2016 Cubs and like they they talk about it like every other day in spring training and uh, it it kind of became a joke of a uh, you know let's get over it like let's do this every other weekend in in uh, in Chicago they have Ben Zobris there you know to talk <laughs> about his his base hit so yeah so I mean but again the 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 19 uh, World Series definitely helped us out or at least helped me out I don't know what it did for Kipnis yeah. Jan has the 2019 <laughs> World Series. I have 2019 Cabs and Pinot Noirs to help me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got. So they do. And uh, so I played there the following or uh, in 20. And when the whole most of the roster was still there, when Rizzo and Brian and Javi and all of them were still there. And um the best thing about it, especially the group that was there, they meet it head on. It, it's that's the best way to avoid the awkwardness of it. Like we're, I'm stretching in the morning uh, with Rizzo and he's like, Hey, look up there. Look at that banner. Do you remember that? And I was like, yeah, I fucking remember it. Thanks buddy. But it's just like, <laughs> it, happens. it happens. It's not it's like, you can't change it. It happened. We lost. It's, it's just part of the game and uh, you move on. And there's you once the good thing about baseball players is there's always that next at bat that next day, you're able to flip the page a little bit. So while me and Jan on that retrospect, especially I never won one. So it's like, I'll, you'll never fully get over it. 
mentally you can turn the page though and because you 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 get better at accepting things and looking to the next challenge to to win that one instead of dwelling on the past one mm-hmm. but to your point man um just to add on to that every time we go back to cleveland like i've gotten to play there a couple of times you still get people to say thank you man like what yeah. that meant to that organization at that time was a was a huge deal i mean it was a it was a big time i mean um that whole city still thanks us when we come back into town and we joked around about, you know, that reunion is going to be super awesome because of how close that group was. So, uh, yeah, that 16 World Series was almost a finished season with the best group of guys that I've, you know, that yeah. we've got to play with. Um, I still got I just went to a basketball game here in Chicago and I got stopped by three Clevelanders that just like, hey, man, I just want to say thank you. Uh, people don't realize like Cleveland was like the sports mecca for a good few years with the Cavs, with LeBron and ring ceremony over the world series, like going on at the same time, that was the place to be in the sports world. And uh, you're, you're having a fun transition. Cause I don't know if we have it pulled up yet, but we're talking about how close this group is. Cleveland group still has a, a group chat going on. We still have tons of texts that go on. <laughs> um, you, you can't just cause we don't play together anymore. You can't stop talking shit to each other. So one of the best group chats and one of the re- most recent one was a highlight of Jan's from this past season. <laughs> of a still photo of a game Drew Smiley was throwing. And I know we wanted to oh. cover this topic. Um, <laughs> I believe, are, are you upside? Are your feet above your head in midair or is it his feet? And there's some still photo where one flipped the other one to ruin a, a perfect game. And it wasn't ruined. The guy was going to be safe. I think it was just his swinging bunt where he rolled it out. There, there. it is. So let's see. There we go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> the whole Cleveland group that has it, the me, Brantley, Tomlin, Kluber, Chiz, and all, uh, we didn't we didn't let this one go. So we, we have a still photo of that and immediately text it to Jan. So Jan, I'm sure, came back to the locker room with a text from all of us during that one. I mean, so yeah, I mean, there it is. There's Talk about you meeting it head on. This was me right after the game, um, put a helmet on just to like, it was hilarious because I put that helmet on and they're about to do the interview and all the reporters are like, I'm like, go ahead, man, ask the question. I know what you guys are about to ask. <laughs> like it, it locked them up. So, uh, so then I just took over the, the interview. Um, what do you want me to say about that? I don't know how you want me to answer. This. <laughs> I do I have a comment on that. It's a freak. Um, yeah, no. Well, 10 out of 10 times I, that play might still happen because I'm yelling. I got it. No one will ever see that. Um, and even uh, Smiley uh, said, I heard you saying I got it, but both of us, nine out of 10 times, he will not go out for that ball. But you know what? <laughs> just it happened. I mean, it's one of those things. That always hey. is a problem. Pitchers trying to be athletes. Not on my watch. Not it's on my watch. That is, that is so leader. true. That's why he's a leader. You can definitely. But hey, uh, on go ahead. On go that, ahead. no, on that. Um, I know you. Uh, AJ um, is on this as well, and we. Mm-hmm. I think it might have been like a month later. Um, I don't remember exactly where we were, and I mean, AJ and I don't have like. I mean, I know him because we played against each other quite a bit, um, but we don't know each other that well. And this is how much respect I have for him, and how much respect I have even more for him. Because if you can't make fun of me because of that play, then don't ever make fun of me. AJ didn't even say hi or anything. Just went straight to it like, dude, no perfect game, huh? You want you didn't want him to have it, huh? <laughs> Just straight to it. And I was like, you know what? I appreciate that. Because if you don't can't make fun of me, then lot. don't try to make fun of me the any other time. <laughs> so, AJ so also loves the that. Cubs. So, you know, yeah. any chance he gets to compliment <laughs> the Cubs. Oh, I'm sure he does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just going to say I was just going to say that like Jan, you could probably go through the annals of time and see all the plays that Jan has made on that ball and I would say that's mm. that's Jan's ball a lefty a lefty reaching down I don't care what pitcher it is there's not one athletic lefty that's picking that ball up and throwing it let alone yeah. a pitcher that's your play you're going to do that you're going to do that like spin no scope throw with your bazooka cannon that kip is wearing on his shirt you had yeah, I appreciate that, that. I, I'm, I'm if you can feel it i'm going over there and giving you a hug i've needed that no. i still get they made t-shirts like the next day that they uh that company in 
company in Chicago made it the next day. And I was, I threw every single one of them away. Just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I, I mean, I respect that you, you brought the football helmet into the mix there because, you know, season gets long. I, I, I think those little things are necessary, you know, a little more of that, a little more flavor, a little more character, you know, to kind of play up the moment for our sport. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, th- those are for sure things that I learned in Cleveland. Uh, that group, there wasn't anything that we let it slide. And then when I went into D.C., it was kind of the same thing, just a, an older group. And, uh, I mean, why not, man? Uh, uh, media wants to take advantage sometimes of, uh, of capitalizing on a moment, and I decided to, uh, you know, to trump them and get, a, get ahead of it. Listen, this game knocks you down enough already yeah. with the your, the successful you hear that three times out of a ten is the best. If, you, if you're getting beaten down by this game enough, and then you also have teammates, <laughs> Too, that just will pile it on if you can't learn to take a joke or to to smile at yourself or smile at some situations or at least make light of some stuff just to keep your head above the water it's it's going to make it that more more much more rough and i i Jan knows this i've struggled with it at times i'm sure everyone struggles with it at times to just fully see the positive or to like hey man nice line drive even though it was right at someone you're like i'm still over one i don't care about the line drive i'd rather have a swinging bunt it's like you got to be able to have a little humility and smile at yourself and find ways to distract yourself. If it's with humor, with anything, just because this game can really take its mental toll at times. Absolutely. Well, Jan, it was awesome yeah. catching up with you, dude. Good reminiscing. Um, congrats on the option. We'll uh, maybe Kratz and me. will see you before Kip does in Chicago. To see you next year. <laughs> We're going to hang out. So I'm, much. I'm, I'm quite sure that I'll be talking to you guys before I talk to Kip again. <laughs> Hey, Jan, are you wearing that watch that's on your wrist? Like, watches are flexes. That watch you got on your wrist, is that an iPad? That thing is ginormous. Uh, <laughs> Kratz, we're both getting old, man. Those things, these things, I can't really see them anymore. I got to <laughs> – the lettering needs to get bigger. <laughs> no, man, like, wait until, yeah. wait, until you're, wait until you're done playing. Whenever that is, five years, two years, whatever it is, you're going to feel tremendous. And I played, like – a third of the games that you played. So you're going to be <laughs> tremendous, especially with all your on it, with all your on it supplements you're taking, you are fit and virile. <laughs> oh no, it's all the NSF, right, Kip? If it's NFS, oh, it's... NSF, it works. That, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's that, that's that pitch com. That's pitch com, but 24 seven. We're working that's on a new addition to it. Wife and kids. Yeah. Hey. That's 100% right. That's... <laughs> Pick me up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Jan, great to talk dishes. to you, man. Enjoy the off season. Absolutely, guys. Thank you, guys. Hey, Kip, Thanks, great bye. to see you, man. Me too. Miss you, <laughs> See you, guys. Cheers. See you soon. Jan Gomes, uh, Chicago Cubs, former <laughs> Cleveland player. Uh, that was good stuff. I like that. Um, we got Ken Rosenthal joining us in like a minute. Um, is he a he former? Is, is he a former room. Cleveland Indian, or is he a former? Yeah, like Indian. You mean? Versus Guardian? How are we supposed to say that? Like, no, I you went say to Cle- training with the Cleveland Indians. He played for the Cleveland Indians. He didn't play for the Guardians. So yeah. was he a Cleveland Indian, or do you address him as a Cleveland? I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's in poor taste to say that he played for the Indians. He did play, in fact, for the Indians. And, not and the never played for the Guardians. I think. Correct. I mean, might have Correct. Played, I don't know. But. Yeah, I've, I've asked a couple Cleveland players about that. And they were like, oh, yeah, we, they said, I didn't play for the Guardians. I played for the Indians. And that's how, you know, when I, I, maybe there was a conversation about that because obviously the name was changed for those reasons um, to kind of get with the times. But yep. that's how people I hesitate. I hesitate every time I, I go to say, like, yeah, in 17, I signed with the Cleveland. I, I, I say I play for the Indians. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I think that works. I want to be Indian. right. I want to be right. Well, yeah, but they, th- that wasn't the name of the team back then. So, right. You know, it's like, would you say that? I don't know if this is the best comparison, but, you know, if you were on a, on the Rangers, but would you say like it was on the Senators or, you know, like how you, you start going back to different yeah. teams and shit? Did you play for the Vegas Raiders or the Oakland Raiders? Did you play for. Right. Yeah, but a little different. That's just geographical. Like this was. Oh, name change. Name. 
Anyway. Redskins were a team for a while. Then it was yeah, end, yeah. what is it? Commanders. Washington football team, then it's Commanders, <laughs> and then they might change again. So, anyway, um, we've done enough tap dancing for Ken Rosenthal to join us. Our uh, FT Senior Insider. First off, most importantly, are you in quarantine right now? Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Actually, I'm in St. Louis, and AJ's going to be here too. There's a celebration of Tim McCarver's life going on tonight. Actually, there's an event, and then tomorrow is the, I guess, ceremony you would call it. And believe it or not, they've asked AJ to speak. I don't really understand the thinking there, but we're going to find out, I guess, tomorrow. Yes, yes. I have context on this, Kratz. So, nope. yeah, go ahead. You know, do you know about this, Kratz, the order? No, I was just going to say he's well-versed in the vernacular, so he would mm-hmm. be illustrious at his engagement of speaking. I'm at the compound, <laughs> Ken, so just so you know for a little background, and I'm sure AJ will tell you this himself you know, 50 times, but um, the order is, I believe, Joe Buck, Bob Costas, and then AJ Pusinski. <laughs> That's not the number three hitter I won that line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, the pressure is on. All right, so anyway, I do want to start there, though. Did the virus make an impact at the GM meetings? Were, were there less face-to-face, things not getting done? Is everyone okay? I guess everyone is okay. No one on our staff got the virus, as far as I know. Actually, I don't know of any writer that got it. It was simply some club people that were staying at the hotel. Most of the writers were not staying at that particular hotel. It was bad enough that they canceled the last meeting on the last day. So certainly something was going on. I can't speak to actual details. I don't know who got sick. I'm tracking other things at this time of year. (laughs) So it wasn't fun because actually the last day, even the last night, uh, Wednesday night, I kind of got out of there. I'm like, I'm not staying here. Usually I'd stay late and see, try to see as many people as possible, but I just kind of left, and then the next day I didn't come back because they did cancel that final meeting. So it was an odd GM meetings, to say the least. Yeah, and the GI meetings, as Stephanie Epstein called it, was pretty clever. Um, we, we do have one, one tweet to show to, to cap this off from our friend John Heyman, who wanted to make sure everyone knew, Ken, that he went to in and out most nights, okay? So he's good. It was It's funny when you start to get reporters saying what they ate and that they are okay <laughs> versus what the news is. Right. Well, we all had some fun with it, but yeah. I'm sure for the people who were ill, it was not that fun. No. Agreed. John's Agreed. So. The bathroom the whole time. Yeah, we're, we're hoping everybody feels better on that yeah. front, um, yeah, in all sure. seriousness. Okay, so, Ken, let's start with what you wrote about the Brewers the other day, digging into your notes in The Athletic. The column is up there, and I think there's been a lot of buzz around what you wrote, and I would say speculating from fans. Like, what are we going to do here? I mean, is this going to look like a rebuild? Because the team doesn't usually go down this route, but will they take advantage what else can you add and, and what else have you seen since you put that out there about the fact that the Brewers can go in a variety of directions? And the, you know, here's the crazy part to me when I was reading what you were putting out there, Ken. They won the division last year and it's not like they're losing everyone. Woodruff was only on the team for half the year because of injury. Right. Scott, it's a situation to be sure. And the Brewers are, let's face it, a low revenue team. They've been that. And what is happening here is a question of timing. So Burns, Woodruff, and Adamas are free agents after this coming season. Devin Williams is a free agent after the following season. And they have a nice young group of position players, a core that is forming. And the thinking would be, if they made some trades, that they could perhaps acquire some pitching, some younger pitching, to complement those young position players. Now, Their owner, Mark Atanasio, has always been opposed to a straight rebuild. They haven't done that, and they haven't needed to do that. But here they are. They just lost counsel. And I don't know that one thing has anything to do with the other, but given that you've lost your manager, you have a a certain situation here with a number of players, it's something that they have to look at. All teams listen on all players at all times. We know that. But what I was told, and the reason I wrote what I did, is 
that there's a little bit more going on here, that they're listening and they're interested in kind of exploring some things. And I know some Brewers fans got upset with this, same Brewers fans who were telling me I was full of it when I was writing about Council possibly leaving. But the reality is teams have to look at their various windows, as we discuss, and decide what is best for them at that particular moment. And what might be best for the Brewers at this particular moment would be to trade Burns for sure, one year left, trade Adamas, and then see what's out there for some of the others. If you're going to trade those two, maybe you trade Devin Williams with two years of control. Remember, the last time they had a big-time closer, they traded him at the deadline with one-plus year of control. That was essentially, or would be essentially, where Devin Williams would be at this year's deadline. So those are just some names. They can look at others, too. But if you're the Brewers, you have to be considering all possibilities here. And you have to be considering the direction that I wrote about. Now, in your article, you said teams don't actively go to teams and say, hey, do you want my guy? Teams come and say, hey, you know, you, hey, we're inquiring about your guy. Are you insinuating that possibly there's a little bit more of the other? Or what you said, you said there's a little bit more than just the like teams coming to the Brewers and saying, hey, what will it take to get Burns and Adamas? I think what I wrote, Eric, was more about their public positioning. And what they'll say is, we're not shopping our players. We're merely listening. When in reality, they might shop our players. It does happen. So I don't know exactly at what level the Brewers are with this, but they certainly are listening. And it often is semantics and it kind of cracks me up. I once wrote a whole article about the lies you hear at the winter meetings. And one is, we're not shopping our players. We're just listening. <laughs> it goes on all the time. And the point of what I wrote in that particular part of the article was that this seems to be a little bit more than simply listening. This seems to be a real consideration of a strategy of going somewhat backwards to go forwards later. All right. From one team that has some talent that could be traded, you wrote about Bobby Witt Jr. And I'm going to present you something because... You know, maybe there's negotiations. There's not. Let's say these negotiations don't work out well. Bobby Witt's looking like a minimum $200 million player. Not saying the Royals can't afford it. But with two years of service, because nobody's ever done it, could they trade a guy like Bobby Witt Jr., who there's no other good, unless Adamas is on the market, could they trade a guy like that who's never going to sign? Because every year, if he continues to do what he does, He's going to be a $300 million player. Then he's going to be a 300 and the Royals don't touch that. Could they trade him in, an, in a year, in an offseason like this, where it's a weak free agent class? I don't see it, Eric, but I know where you're going with it. Because if you can't sign him to an extension, then what are you looking at? You're looking at perhaps keeping him for the entirety of his six years of control and letting him walk, which teams can certainly do. Most teams haven't done that lately, but they used to do that a little bit more often. And... You could take that perspective on it. But with Wit, it's really interesting. A year ago, when all the big free agent contracts for shortstops started going down, Turner and Bogarts and Correa, all of those, Dansby Swanson was another one. If you were the Royals, why, well, actually, not if you were the Royals, the Royals at that time were thinking, man, we're never going to be able to keep this kid. There's no way. And he went on to have an amazing season, right? 30 homers, 49 steals, 96 RBIs. But circumstances have changed a little bit. They know that obviously it will cost hundreds of millions to keep wit. But they've had some internal discussions, and it's not as if they're saying there's no way we can do this. They're looking at it. And they're looking at it in part because they're trying to get a new stadium built. And they want to sell that to the public. And if you trade Bobby Witt, to get to your point, Eric, you trade Bobby Witt when you're trying to get a stadium built, good luck. So there is some momentum, perhaps. Actually, that's a strong word. Momentum is not the right word. But there is some thought that maybe they make him the Royals version of Patrick Mahomes. Maybe they make him the guy who is going to be the centerpiece of their future as they go forward and hopefully get into this new ballpark at some point in the near future. I don't know that it all will work out. Obviously, it's going to cost a lot of money, but we have a template from the Julio Rodriguez deal, a template from the Austin Riley deal, 
these were different contracts that were signed at different stages of players' careers. Corbin Carroll was another one. Corbin Carroll was less than 100 days of service. Julio, I believe, was less than a year of service or a year plus. And Riley was two plus years. So you can look at those contracts. That's the starting point, or those are the starting points. Obviously, Wick Jr. is a middle of the diamond player, so he might be even more valuable than those guys. But it's not out of the question that this could happen. I want to tie in two stories to your red story about Joey Votto. There's no playing time, right? You wrote there's no there's no playing time. They might even have an excess of position players. And they're going to kind of platoon or like mix in DH first base, which I'm assuming is going to be with, you know, league minimum type of players is, is how I read what you were writing. But then across essentially across the state, you know, you got to pass Pittsburgh over to Philly. They're putting their franchise keystone in Bryce Harper at first base. Who's doing the right thing? Both, I would say. And Mm. I understand the Reds' position. They have seven position players in their infield. Now, Nick Senzel might be a non-tender candidate, so that would be six. But most of those players, actually four of them, were rookies last year. These are young guys. And they can find playing time at first base DH for Steer and Canacion Strand. They can do this any number of ways. And Joey Votto would have clogged up that picture. And if we had Joey sitting with us right now, he probably would admit that as well. So for the Reds, this makes a lot of sense. And actually, it might even make sense to trade a guy like Jonathan India if they can get the pitching back in return that they like. The Phillies, it's an entirely different situation. It's a question of what is best for Bryce Harper and his career and what is best for their team going forward. And I can see the logic of Harper at first, number one for his career. He is a guy who, as we know, plays really hard. Putting him at first base will reduce the wear and tear on his body somewhat. It's not nothing, obviously, playing first base, but you don't have to run to the outfield every inning and you don't have to, of course, chase balls down the way outfielders do. From the Phillies' perspective, it kind of opens up the outfield a little bit. They have some younger, good defensive players, Rojas, Pache, Brandon Marsh, of course. They still have Castellanos on their roster, and there's been talk that possibly he would be traded, but it seems to me this makes it a little easier to keep him. And then you have Schwarber in the DH spot. So it kind of improves them defensively in some respects, and it gives them a little bit more flexibility. Now, obviously, it was bad news for Reese Hoskins, who is a free agent and meant a lot to that team and that franchise. But I thought that was the way they would go as long as Bryce Harper was willing to do that. And it certainly seems like he thinks first base could be a good thing for him in the future. What are you hearing about disgust with Aaron Nola in the sense of is he seen as a stable rotation piece with possible upside years? Or is he seen as like a flat-out one or two that's going to come and save a rotation? A little of both. He certainly is a stable rotation piece. I don't know about upside. Eric, he's 30. He kind of is who he is, and I don't know that he'll get much better. Certainly could get better as he gets a little older because of his sheer experience. But the thing that recommends Aaron Nola the most is his durability. Second in innings, just to Garrett Cole since 2018. Now, the last three years, two of those years, he's had high ERAs, but he was really good in the playoffs this year, and he's certainly someone, because of his style, his repertoire, it would suggest that he's going to age well. So a lot of teams like Aaron Nola, especially in this day and age when you have so few starters who go deep into games to save bullpens, here's one that actually does and actually takes pride in doing it hasn't been on the injured list with an arm injury since, I believe, 2016. Hasn't been on the injured list at all since 17. So this guy is reliable, he's durable, and he's going to do well. And I know some of the initial free agent projections for the starting pitchers for guys like him were in the $120, $125 million range. Even Snell was somewhat low, in my opinion. I would expect that the whole group is going to do better than those lower projections. I think they're going to be doing really well. Yamamoto above 200 million. Blake Snell and Nola, in my view, could be above 150. I'm not great at predicting this stuff, but it just seems to me the demand for these pitchers 
in this era is going to be so great that they're all going to do really well. Okay, so we have a fan question. It fits in perfectly. We are very prepared for this one. Sean Ireland in the chat. Manager update for Padres, Brewers, and Astros. Well, we're going to take a trip down memory lane, Ken, back like a month ago when we were trying to figure out an over-under of how many manager changes (laughs) there would be. So let's run that. Over-under over the next week, one and a half manager announcements. I would say firings, but you know how some teams will (laughs) carefully craft their wording. One and a half, though. I feel like... That could be a tough number over the next week based on what I've read from your article a couple days ago. What do you think? Well, first of all, Scott, I have to ask, is Terry Francota included in this? Because he is no. stepping down. All right, no. So you're asking one and a half firing. Yeah, like, you know, if the Astros miss out on the playoffs, Dusty, which you wrote about, you know, yes. Buck situation, Boone and, and Melvin. I don't know in the next week, one and a half, but I would say over the next month, yes, one and a half. And you know over. what, guys? He's over. over. Yes. So, Ken, that number hit during that week and then has now, what, tripled since then? (laughs) I think I went on to say in that discussion that there are always things that happen that we don't expect. That's always true. And if I had to guess even then, if you had said really put a number on it, I would have put it at probably three or four. And we've exceeded that. It's certainly been a lively period with the managerial merry-go-round. More lively than I expected. The council thing just blew everyone away. And even the Bob Melvin situation, very unusual. A guy would leave a team to go to a division rival with the team's blessing that was letting him go. So we've had a lot going on, for sure. And yes, there are three jobs left. So I guess you want me to go through those teams. I'll do my best. With the Padres, it certainly seems it's going down to... Ryan Flaherty, who's been on their staff, and Mike Schilt, who also has been on their staff, the former Cardinals manager. A.J. Preller at the GM meetings basically said he wants someone that he knows from working with in the past recent times. He wants someone he has worked with. He thinks that's best. He had Bob Melvin, hadn't worked with him before. He had Jace Tingler, had not worked with him before. Andy Green, the same. And those didn't work out for him. So now his thinking is, all right, let's get a guy that I'm familiar with that I'm comfortable with. And my guess would be that it will be Flaherty, but I don't know that for sure. With the Astros, Joe Espada is certainly a guy who has been waiting long enough. He's been the bench coach. He's had a lot of responsibility under Dusty Baker and A.J. Hinch before him. He's someone who, for whatever reason, has not gotten a job yet, even though he's interviewed a bunch of times. Dana Brown, the GM, spoke highly of him this week. The question is whether the owner, Jim Crane, will go along with that. Jim Crane is a guy who likes names. He likes sizzle. And Joe Espada is a big name in Houston, I guess, because he's been there with the team. But he's not, for instance, Don Mattingly or Buck Showalter or someone like that. So that's going to be really interesting to see, basically, if Jim Crane lets Dana Brown pick the manager. We'll see. Now, There was one more left, and that would be the Brewers. The Brewers general manager, Matt Arnold, came out at the GM meetings and said that bench coach Pat Murphy is someone that they're looking at quite heavily. He was the bench coach under counsel. And for continuity's sake, Pat Murphy would be the right choice. He's popular with his players, and he's a guy that you can certainly see stepping in and doing it. He was the interim, or one of the interims, in San Diego under Preller. How... Ultimately, it shakes down. I don't know. I would assume they're going to interview some outside candidates as well. But it certainly sounds like Murphy is a leading candidate for that position. And we'll see if, in the end, he becomes the Brewers manager or if he goes to the Cubs as council's bench coach, which I would imagine is another opportunity that is available to him. So we still have the three left, and it's been kind of a crazy time for sure. I love it. Well, I hope that we get decisions next week. Ken, appreciate it. Um, you look well rested, so uh, enjoy the better. next time period. That better, yeah, <laughs> and doing better than most. So we hope everyone gets well soon, um, and I uh, hope you're gearing up for the next battle, which will be winter meetings. Absolutely. Yes. Well, have a good weekend, Ken. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Ken Rosenthal with us on FT. Um, like getting a fan question in there too. And appreciate a lot of the comments today. Like, Oh, you guys are running all off season. Yes, we are. 
every weekday. We're here for you. So let's get to some awards talk for a sec. Uh, next week, they'll reveal the winners. And we're going to do a little MLB Perfect Inning 23 Cy Young discussion right now to go over some flamethrowers. Now, the discussion on who's going to win the award, Kip, would be kind of boring because Blake Snell is winning. It's like, oh, excuse me. Yes, confirmed. Okay, Blake Snell is winning. And up oh, here comes word from the BBWAA, fakely. Oh, Garrett Cole is winning. And actually, if you watched yesterday's show, Kevin Gossman even said it himself. I'm not winning. <laughs> Garrett Cole is winning the award. Do we have everybody's picks from the beginning of the year? We don't have them. I mean, All the ones I can get them for you verbally, probably. Uh, we have a board that we posted, of course, because yeah. we keep receipts. Um, Did you have Cy Young? Did you have – Who I had. I'm trying to – That's why, in the I'm NL. pretty sure oh, you have Blake Snell. Blake Snell and Garrett Cole. We all picked <laughs> Blake Snell and Garrett Cole. I might have had Cole, but uh, – No, I no had way. Had. Anybody, nobody on our list – picked Blake Snell. There's no, no way. No. I didn't. I know I didn't have it. I might have had There's no Shohei, way. Actually. I went for the double of Shohei. MVP oh. And Cy Young. And Cy. Oh, Cole okay. is definitely, I think, on at least a list or two. Kip, you had Otani and Alcantara. Um, okay, what else I you got Max, for us? I know I had Max Freed. And, and McClanahan. Shane McClanahan. Injuries are going to get you. It happens. You were looking good for a little bit. Nobody had Cole? Nobody Who had Who did I have? Cole. Who did I have? Let's embarrass me. You had Max Freed. Or Shannon. Or McClanahan. I definitely. I did not have Freed. Maybe. I didn't pick? No. A lot of DeGrom Cease. Cease and I wonder who had Cease. Yeah. He's I not wonder. here. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Adam Jones picked Dylan Cease. Steve. Never mind. Wow. Okay. And AJ. There you and AJ, AJ. No surprise there. Who's Homer. the most surprising of the six finalists to you? So obviously wipe off Snell and Cole. They're going to win. Who's the most surprising on that list? Name it again real quick just to, for the audience. Of the finalists. And I'll give you mine as I'm going through them. Surprising like before the season or surprising like what we know now? Like, oh, I didn't I would think. say before the season, you know. So, so you've got – Logan Webb, Blake Snell, and Zach Gallen. On the other side, you have Kevin Gossman, Garrett Cole, and Sonny Gray. For me, it's Sonny Gray and Logan Webb. Logan Webb a little bit, but Logan Webb, and you saw how they were in the playoffs if, like two years ago or something. He's nasty. Uh, I just think he doesn't he doesn't have the overpowering stuff that Cole might have that can just brush through lineups, but when his stuff is moving the way it can, it's, it's not hard to see. But if you're turning him surprised, yeah, maybe out of the comparatively speaking to the other ones, sure. I would say based on how the season went, like before the season, you would definitely think Logan Webb's going to be up there for 100% gallon. So Webb would be. But for me, the guy it, that, that I think surprised people even during the season, Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray, and this guy is – like he's another one of these short, short, pit, short pitchers that is super athletic. Like he's a guy, honestly, when he was with Oakland <laughs> and voter, Stephen vote always, always would tell me this story when he got traded over to New York and I was with Sonny in New York and Sonny, he, he agreed with the story. He's like, it's not, it's not false. He goes, you know what, man, sometimes I'm halfway through the pitch. I know you threw, you called cutter. But I just feel like a sinker is the better pitch. So you're looking for like 97 cutter, and he's like, nah, 90, 97 sinker. So it's like he's an athletic dude that can manipulate pitches, manipulate the ball. I just didn't think Kyle Bradish should have been left off this list. So I don't think Sonny Gray necessarily is undeserving. I think he should be up there. I just think Kyle Bradish is a guy that came out and did it all year long and the the players the players chose it too the players thought he was one of the top three pitchers Sonny Gray is one of the more uncomfortable at bats oh to ha he never throws his balls never straight and he never throws it where you want it to be you're like okay at least I have my head in the count here because he's cutter cut off the plate way too much and now I'm up 2-0 and it's like okay I'm gonna look 
over the plate now maybe outer third nope right back into the kitchen and it's mo- it's like he never gives you what you want and it's just so frustrating and it's like you 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 have to wait for that one pitch but like all year long it looks like i mean 279 era you ain't giving people that my that pitch that pitch never came for a lot of people and i believe he had the best home run rate home run prevention in he, baseball during the season you don't it's he's so hard to get the ball up into the air like it's his stuff just buries down at the bottom of the zone. He lives there. He rarely misses up. And if he is up, it's because he wanted to be there uh, or it's for a show. But it's usually maybe one pitch max in a bat that he goes up. Otherwise, he knows I'm going to keep this ball down. I'm looking for ERA plus two, Kratz. So Sonny Gray was 154 this year. And Bradish was 146. Pretty close. 283 ERA for Bradish in 168 and two-thirds. In the past, too, you would say, oh, he had to pitch in Camden Yards, but Camden Yards is not the same Camden Yards anymore. I mean, still, would you still consider it a hitter's ballpark? Yeah. Yeah. Well, center center over to right is still very much a hitter's park. Right. Okay. Um, So anyway, uh, breaking news, Snell's going to win and Cole's going to win. And Snell's going to get paid a lot of money. He's won two Cy Young awards. He's not old. And there's also going to be teams that are like, I think I can get that with a little more consistency. And even if it is five shutout innings, like, cool. Most teams will take five shutout innings every start versus, you know, a dude that they don't want to push. I mean, it's it's efficiency too. I mean, if he gets to 100-something pitches, Right, hundred pitches, hundred five pitches. Teams just don't let you go anymore, too. So that's just how here's, it is, right, Kratz? Here's my no, for sure. You're exactly right. They don't let you go anymore. But my thing would be this team that signs them. You look at the third time through. You have to tailor all your scatter reports individually to pitchers. You're not going to have Blake Snell pitch the same as Martin Perez pitches. It's just not smart. So why handle them the same way? And I can't wait till Blake comes on here. And gives us his spiel about, you know, hey, man, I'm just trying to do my best and all this stuff, bro. When the reality is, he is a unicorn in the sense that I think hitters were hitting 136 third time through the order against him this year. So, to me, I'm going to go to Blake and I'm going to say, guy, we gave you $160 million. I want you to tell us when you don't have enough. Exactly. Exactly what Kip just said. Like, it is not his fault that he's coming out of the game. People say, well, he throws too many balls. He throws too many. The game wants strikeouts. He is delivering you strikeouts. He has shown the third time through the order, he actually gets better. Now, don't get me wrong. I think I think opponents hit like 208 against him. So if you're going to, if you're going to this level to get this guy, tailor it to him. Hey, you know what? Every three outings, we're going to let you go to 120 pitches. And you know what he's going to say? Give me that ball. Just like Kip said, here's the ball. He's going to say, give me that ball. And until he breaks your trust, run that man out there because that is your horse and he has shown it and proven it. And I would challenge whatever team to sign him, don't take the kid's gloves off. Take them off. Let him go. My question is. Can I, can I echo? I just want to touch on that real quick. Is who's taking him out in the sense of are you guys in Kratz? You might be able to hint on this or you know where I'm going with this. Is it the manager? Is the reason Preller wants someone he's worked with because he knows he's going to get someone who's going to say yes to him and is coming above the manager's call? Like you, there's got to be some feel for why these guys are being taken out of the game this early when they this- go. No, 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 no. You're, you're right. This is a continuity of an organization. Okay. Yeah. You have, I'll give you the four sections of the organization. You have minor league development, you have scouts, you have the big league team, and you have training staff. If all four of those can't agree on how to run things, that's where the GM steps in and says, okay, you know, we're doing this, or pre- president of baseball operations, whatever it is, they step in and they say, okay, this is how we're going to run things. If there's not continuity in that, you're going to have struggles. So every day, a manager gets a card, okay? It's going to look exactly like this, and it's going to have every pitcher on it. 
And every pitcher's times that they've gotten dry humped when they've gotten warmed up in the bullpen is going to be on this on this line. Every time they've pitched is on this line. And then it's going to be color-coded. And you're going to have color coding on who can pitch and stuff in the bullpen. And then at the bottom, it's going to have your, your starting pitchers. And the starting pitchers are going to have red, green, and yellow. And that's going to dictate if you're in a yellow, hey, you know what? This guy's an 80 to 100 pitch guy. If you're in the green, he might be a 90 to 110 pitch guy. If he is in the red, this start, he may only get 75 pitches. And that is based on knowledge from the analytics. That is based on scouts seeing what this guy did before and reading the numbers of what he did before and the training staff saying, well, this is the percentage of times that people break down. But, and to me, if you don't have if you don't have continuity in there in the sense that Bob Melvin should have been able to go to Blake Snell and say, hey, how do you feel? And if Blake Snell comes back and goes, I'm good, dog. Like, take the ball. It's my free agent year. Then fine. But I don't see Blake Snell doing that. Knowing him as a teammate for six weeks that we were teammates, that dude was like, he's not going to put up a fight, but he's also not going to be like, uh, here you go. I've done well, so I don't want this ball anymore. He wants that. So a manager has to a manager has to save his players, but he also has to win the ball game. Yeah. And also, Kip, he's got to limit his walks. I mean, that's the one other thing. Like this year, he was he was dominant. He was absolutely dominant. And he would walk dudes and then he would punch dudes out. So he would get in trouble. And when you're looking at an award, it's different from how you're projecting things forward, right? You're you're as a team, you're just like. Hey, dude, we just got to figure out ways to keep you in the zone more. And for, for some guys, that works. And for others, it doesn't. This was his career high walk rate. I don't think that necessarily means that's what's going to be the future for him. I mean, hey, Kratz knows. Jose Alvarado, most teams were like, oh, he's a mess. He can't throw strikes. And then he came to Philly, and he was pretty damn good. So um, I think and, there's another gear still. I think there's teams looking at him like, yo, I, there's one more level here. And because he's won the two Cy Youngs. So it's not like it's not like, oh, man, you know. That was – he was overachieving. Nobody overachieves. The years Kipnis was an all-star, he didn't overachieve. To me, injuries or, or like whatever it was got in the way the years he wasn't an all-star. So Snell is a Cy Young candidate year in and year out. And as a free agent, you need to look at him and say, well, what does he offer? Because he's impervious to platoon advantages. And teams just constantly – like Gabe Kapler just constantly kept running out right-handed, right-handed batters. And I'm like, oh, I'll take the over on that game over strikeouts. <laughs> because he was better against righties, but teams who are like, oh, oh, righties don't hit better against lefties, so we need to put righties in the lineup. And he was just like, strikeout, strikeout, strikeout. So how many of those walks were, you know, advantage counts for him where it's okay to walk a guy? So that's what I would look into deeper to get the full contract value out of Snell. Yeah. By, and by the way, he's he's probably getting $200 million based on how many teams need starters. Rodon last year was 6'162", and I don't think they're in the same weight class at all. Like, based on durability, based on track record, based on age still, too. It's not like, you know, Snell's 35 years old. He's, what is he, 30? 31? You can just stop at your first one. You said durability. There's a lot of these guys have the stuff to go out and dominate for any given night, but it's the ones who can continually show up every fifth day. That's the ones you need to count on. That's the ones you put your money towards. Yep. I'm with you. I All got right, five so years, 185. I, I could see that. The only reason I I, th I could over under two hundo, I, I, I think he'll tip over two hundo just, just based on stuff, market. based on where he's at, based on the market, based on the Rangers just winning with – Starting pitching, you know, all of that. I like and it. I think he tips it. You got over or under 200, Kip. I got just under. Just I'm got under. like 190, 195s. Yeah. Okay. Because people Six are talking years. 200. People are talking 200 for Yamamoto. Well, now he's younger. How old is he? How old is Snell? 30. He's 30? Uh, I mean, he'll be, he'll be 31. He's turned 31 in a couple of days. Okay. And that's the difference. Yamamoto's 25. He's in a great position. 
To me, if you go six years, if you go six years, it's over. I'm yeah. saying, I'm saying it's like a, it's like a two ten, but I'm saying it's going to be a five year. Oh shoot! I mean, teams teams are dragging these things out like nine years, but we haven't seen them drag out. We haven't seen them drag out pitchers' contracts. Not like position players. Listen, there's nope. a good. If there's ever a bad time, but there's a good time to win a Cy Young, and it's right before you go become. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, for the prediction business, what I've always learned is I usually come up with what I come up with, and the one thing I do is I usually add a year because I'm okay. thinking that – and I also read articles and see what other people smarter than me are saying. But you know, if there's a bunch of people going, oh, he's going to get 5, 180 or whatever it is, okay, well, then there's probably some teams maybe thinking that way, and one team's going to say six That's deal. Usually how, that's usually how it goes. Yeah. What yeah. I do what I do is I watch, I watch the network, and then I go – I'm going to multiply that, multiply <laughs> that because the owners are trying to drive down prices and they're like, here it is. Here's your numbers across the desk. This is what we want the value to be on our players. My, my former teammate, Brian Kenny, put out a thing like a couple months ago saying what? It was like 200 million or something for Otani. I think it was 325 million. And he was like, I don't know if I do it or not. And I was like, Oh my gosh, Otani's going to get six hundred and fifty million dollars. That's just why. Like, I mean, that was that's a bubble. Enough. TJ gets over two hundred million. Correct. It's just they're they're in a little bubble there on, the on on some of those topics. That's why our our numbers are looking good in the off season. So anyway, check out MLB Perfect Inning twenty three right now. There it is, MLB Perfect Inning 23. Scan the QR code on your screen right now. Download it for free. And there's all your game features, including various MLB legends, updated team uniforms, rosters, and more. Um, all right, so went a little over time today. Great day. So let's uh, recap for one quick second. We are going to slap hands in a sec and uh, give a special shout out today, obviously, on a Friday for a big day coming up on Saturday. So let's slap. Kratz hats. Little uh, military appreciation hat from the Pirates. Is John with the the uh, digital camo? I always think this is as much as you can't really wear a pirate's hat in Philly. When I wear this hat, I'm not in Philly, but Philly's Philly's territory. When I wear this hat, they're kind of like, okay, okay respect. Like, it's a good looking hat. Digital camo is awesome. So same here. Yeah, shout out to all our vets um, and everyone currently serving. Uh, we appreciate you, Veterans Day. Is Saturday, November eleventh, and uh, yeah, I did the little little camo shirt. So, camo, John. Um, appreciate everyone for joining us today. Good shit, dude. And that was fun with Jan. That was fun. <laughs> I got to text him after this too. Yeah, you gotta you gotta see him gotta after see this, it. dude. You know, yeah, you do. Take the blame. That was my fault. Yeah, that's, that's right. You. That's what this show is for. We're just bringing Bad friends. City host. Bad city host. <laughs> and Kip, I don't know if you're on with us next week, but. Wish, wish, I mean, I'll be there, whatever, for fun. But this guy is a serious contender for for uh, poker Other stuff. Hand. Don't crush it. Don't crush it. Be it I, need, I need food tips. I'm going to pack my own snacks. Eat light. You don't want to miss. You don't want to be antied and blinded to death because we're in the bathroom for 20 minutes. It's very nerve-wracking talking about the poker tournament. Kratz is going to be in with me. Like, fidget spinner, something to just yeah. kind of... I'm just going to hold this. Help the nerves. He is bringing that too, which is incredible. Just put it right on the table. Intimidation. Just put it right, put it, put it on top of your chips or on top of your cards every time you roll. <laughs> the world's best paperweight. Boop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> See everyone next week. <laughs>